afternoon at the White House, President Bush spoke briefly with reporters in the Rose Garden. He talked about his agenda for an economic stimulus package. On September 11, 2001, the world witnessed the most devastating and horrific attacks ever committed on the United States soil. Despite the damage and enormous loss of life those attacks caused, they failed to cripple the nation. To the contrary, this nation has never been more united in its fundamental belief in freedom and its willingness to protect that freedom. The diabolical nature of these attacks was an unimaginable wake-up call to all Americans. We must be prepared for the unexpected. We must have the mechanisms in place to protect this nation and its people from further attempts to cause such massive destruction. Today, the subcommittee will examine the nation's ability to respond to the possibility of a biological or chemical attack, even though most experts believe that the likelihood of such an attack is relatively low we must ensure that the nation has an emergency management structure that is prepared to handle even the most remote possibility of such an attack. The aftermath of the September 11th attacks clearly demonstrated the need for adequate communication systems and rapid deployment of well-trained emergency personnel. Yet, despite billions of dollars in spending on federal emergency programs, there are serious questions as to whether the nation's public health system is equipped to handle a massive chemical or biological attack. A September 2000 report from the General Accounting Office, and that is part of the legislative branch headed by the Controller General of the United States, GAO, found that the 1999 outbreak of the West Nile virus severely taxed the New York public health system. This outbreak, which was ultimately contained, affected hundreds of people. A biological attack could affect thousands more. Today, the subcommittee will examine how effectively federal, state, and local agencies are working together to prepare for such emergencies. We want the people of this nation to know that they can rely on these systems should the need arise. I want to note that we had hoped to have Mayor Giuliani with us today, but the city's ongoing needs rightly take a higher priority. At the conclusion of today's hearings, we will recess and reconvene at a later date to allow the mayor an opportunity to contribute his expertise to this hearing. In addition, the subcommittee will be conducting similar hearings throughout the country. We are fortunate to have witnesses today whose valuable experience and insight will help the subcommittee better understand the needs of those on the front lines, representatives of the nation's hospitals and its cities, counties, and states. We want to hear about their capabilities and their challenges, and we want to know what the federal government can do to help. We welcome all of our witnesses, and we look forward to your testimony. We'll start now with an opening statement from uh, the ranking individual, uh, Mrs. Uh, Maloney and Mrs. Schakowsky, and uh, we want to thank them uh, for the help they've given us in gaining this uh, particular group of individuals. And so I now yield up to five minutes uh, to Ms. Maloney, gentlewoman from New York. Uh, thank you, Chairman Horn and, and uh, Ranking Member Schakowsky for holding this hearing. I'd also like to, to thank our panel of, of witnesses. Over the past few weeks, I have been to Ground Zero many times in New York. The amount of destruction and devastation I have witnessed more than any other assault on U.S. soil is indescribable and overwhelming. While we have maintained our strength and resolve to rebuild and come back stronger than ever, I shudder at the thoughts of what ifs. What if those planes had contained a chemical component or had the capability of releasing a biological weapon? How would our response teams have reacted and could we have handled a two-pronged attack? We now have to think of scenarios that would normally in the past have been unthinkable in order to prepare for any type of attack that may come. 
The FBI disregarded a report of a man who showed up at a flight school wanting to learn how to steer a plane, but he didn't care about learning how to take off or land. Now we have to take every threat seriously. As we quickly learned on September 11th, the world is different and this war is different than any we have fought in the past. The terrorists are becoming more sophisticated and their network is widespread. They are using unconventional, unpredictable means. If they are willing to give up their lives, they can do enormous harm. And the enormous harm could include chemical or biological attacks that threaten the lives of millions of Americans. I am concerned that despite all the carnage we've seen in the financial capital of the world, we are not, we are not making sufficient preparations for a worst case scenario, that we, that we are more complacent than we are prepared. I am told that anthrax and smallpox represent two of the most likely forms of biological warfare. We have seven to 10 million doses of smallpox vaccine, and there are 280 million Americans. One vial of anthrax has the potential to kill tens of thousands of people in the New York City subway system. If anyone conv can convince me by the end of this hearing that we have the infrastructure in place to react to such an attack and prevent mass carnage, I will be pleasantly surprised. I look forward to learning about our local, state, and federal government's level of, of preparedness and ability to coordinate and cooperate with each other. It is important to identify the weaknesses in our infrastructure and then work to address them so we can improve our reaction in a time of crisis. I am also interested in learning about the availability and effectiveness of vaccines and antibiotics for certain bioweapons. Are we partnering with our pharmaceutical companies to prepare for an attack? Or are we going about business as usual after September 11th? We must draw on all of our resources, both public and private, to detect and respond to all terrorism. Again, I thank uh, the chairman and the ranking member for calling this hearing, and I thank all of our panelists for being here. I hope that this will be the first of many hearings that will focus on this tremendously important issue to our country. I thank uh, the gentlewoman, and uh, we will now uh, swear in the witnesses. Uh, this is an investigating committee, and uh, we ask uh, that uh, they uh, raise your stand, raise your right hand, and this includes also the staff behind you, and just if, take the oath, too, so we don't have to keep making changes. The clerk will then get the names of the support. So, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. It'll note for the record that all the witnesses and their support staff have taken the oath. And we, we now uh, start with a very interesting uh, uh, individual in particular, and uh, our first witness is a very unique perspective to share with us, and that's Mrs. McHale, was a victim of the chemical attack that occurred in Tokyo in 1995, and we appreciate very much her willingness to come before the committee and relate her experience. Mrs. McHale, it's a welcome to have you. The chairman. Members of the We're going to have to have the clerk maintain getting the microphone there with everybody. We have a terrible uh, system in this place, and you'd think like with all the space. billions we give out to the executive branch, we don't give much to ourselves. So uh, here we are. Okay. My name is Samuel McHale. I am here to testify about my experience of being poisoned in the Tokyo subway in 1995. But first of all, I would like to express my deepest sympathy to all the victims and their families of the recent terrorist attacks. I would also like to express my greatest respect and support to the rescue workers and both state and municipal government officials who have been working tirelessly since the tragedy. On the morning of March 20th in 1995, I was on my way to St. Luke's International Hospital 
in Tokyo for a prenatal checkup. I was 36 weeks pregnant. I had been living in Japan with my two young children since 1992 with my husband, who had been assigned to the US Embassy in Tokyo as a staff assistant to Ambassador Walter Mondale. I arrived at the subway station around 8 a.m. Um, the train arrived shortly after I reached the platform. As I boarded, I saw on the floor by the door a rectangular package wrapped in a newspaper. A sticky looking um, transparent substance was oozing from it. I walked by the package and sat diagonally across from it. It was about six feet away. I don't remember a particular smell, but I somehow felt the, the air felt thick. Within a minute or two after the train started moving, I noticed that I was having difficulty breathing and I started to cough. I remembered reading a little article earlier that week in the newspaper about chemical substance in a train which made some passengers sick. I worried that exposure to any chemical might be harmful to my baby and decided to move to the next car. Even from the next car, I could still see through the window both the substance and the other passengers. The passengers who remained in the last car were all covering their mouths, coughing hard and had reddened faces. They all appeared sick. At the next station, as soon as the door opened, all the people from the last car rushed to get off, except for an old man who was sitting directly across from the chemical substance. He was still in the seat and appeared unconscious. He had turned purple and soon went into convulsions. A passenger from the, the end train uh, um, car returned into the car and dragged him out. I later learned that this old man was one of the first victims to lose his life that morning. At that moment, there was an announcement in the train that there had been a bomb incident on a different line and that all subways were halting service. We all gasped and hurried off the train. Luckily, the stairs to the street level were nearby. I found a public phone and called my husband. Placing a call was hard because my vision started getting blurry. Distinguishing the taxis from the regular cars were difficult as well. Many people were gathered at the intersection, some sitting on the curb and some people were helping the others. Soon I started hearing sirens and I remember seeing an ambulance nearby. I was lucky enough to get a taxi about 15 minutes later and went to the hospital. Again, I was lucky that I had already an appointment with a doctor because I could see my doctor fairly quickly. He was alarmed at my condition and told me to stay in the hospital. I was soon given a room in a maternity ward and was placed on an IV. My symptoms included a fever, a headache, and blurry vision. The Japanese authorities identified the chemical substance as sarin rather quickly, I think. For by that afternoon, I was given an antidote to sarin, um, atropine. Apparently, the hospital had enough dose for all the patients who needed it. I was released from the hospital two days later and quickly recovered, except for meiosis, darkened vision, which lasted about two months. After the incident, the hospital provided a great care and conducted serine victim surveys periodically, monitoring the emotional distress among the patients and offered counseling for those in need. Several things helped me that day. First, the knowledge that a similar incident involving chemical substance occurred in the train before. Second, my health consciousness, just because I was pregnant, which made me move to the next tra uh, car. Third, my general belief that Japan is actually much less safe than its reputation, which made me pay attention to my surroundings. Lastly, I'm happy to report to you that um, I delivered a healthy baby boy three weeks, 
three weeks later after the incident at the same hospital, and he's now a happy first grader. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you very much. It has been, and uh, we're very glad for your family. And, uh, and uh, thank you very much. And if you can stay uh, with us, we'd appreciate it. Uh, let us now go to uh, Dr. Amy Smithson, the Director of Chemical and Biological Weapons Nonproliferation Project from the Stimson Center. So, Dr. Smithson. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the invitation to appear here today. What you've just heard is an account of a woman who was exposed to the nerve agent sarin. Nerve agents were essentially discovered in the mid-1930s. And in layman's terms, what happens when you're exposed to a very small amount of this stuff is your system short circuits, and death can occur very rapidly, within minutes. Uh, other examples of nerve agent, aside from sarin, would include VX and Tabin. There are two other basic categories of chemical warfare agents, including blister agents, where exposure can occur on the skin or through the lungs, and the result is as the category would describe, heavy, heavy blistering and other side effects that can be much more serious. Examples of blister agents which were used quite frequently during World War I include mustard gas. A third category of chemical weapons is called blood agents, and examples of that agent include hydrogen cyanide. Earlier in an opening statement, I heard mention of one of the biological agents that is discussed quite frequently these days, anthrax. There are two basic kinds of biological agents, and let's keep in mind that these are things that have to be alive when they reach the human lung in a very, very small particle size, 1 to 10 microns, in order to infect us and make us ill. And one of the rumors that keeps on making the rounds these days is that crop dusters are well suited for the purposes of distribution of biological agents. Having spent quite some time with people who fly these aircraft, they assure me that this is not as easily said as is often portrayed today. Crop dusters disperse materials in a micron size of 100, part, 100 microns or above, and that is far, a far cry from the very small particle size that would be needed to infect us. So let's uh, get things straight about crop dusters, please. In terms of biological agents, they come in two basic categories, contagious and non-contagious. Anthrax would be the example that we've heard most often. In fact, there is a case down in Florida, but last year when there was a case in North Dakota, the only people who took notice were those in, in health and public health communities. In our heightened state, I think there are a lot of Americans who are afraid that this is the sign of something worse to come. I simply do not believe that to be the case. Smallpox and plagues are example are examples of contagious biological warfare agents, and these do present a problem if indeed they were ever to be released, a very serious problem. I'd like to return to the case of the cult that did this woman harm to illustrate how difficult it is to achieve a capability to disseminate these agents in a way that would cause mass casualties. Om Shinrikyo was my nightmare case. This was a cult determined to acquire these capabilities and use these weapons. They spent over $30 million on their chemical warfare program. They had a state-of-the-art chemical production facility. They had over 100 scientists and technicians in this program, and they could not figure out how to make the significant quantities of chemical agent that would really cause mass casualties of the type that were seen in New York City a couple of weeks ago. That's one thing we should keep in mind. Their biological warfare program was also quite significant, and they tried for several years to acquire this capability. But the thing we need to understand is that they flopped totally and utterly. Not only could they not acquire the lethal seed cultures, they were unable to disperse what they thought they had in, an, in a manner that would cause us to fall ill. So let's look to what terrorists can do and, and the hurdles that face them in trying to acquire these types of capability and not get carried away with hyperbole and with speculation. In terms of what worries me, what worries me is that this country is peppered 
with over 850,000 facilities that work with hazardous and extremely hazardous chemicals. These facilities, if someone were to sabotage them, would have a very, very dangerous outcome. And there's information that has now been made publicly available about these facilities. And if there's one thing that I ask from you today, it is that you take steps to make sure that that information is contained. Um, the remarks that I will conclude with here are based on a study that I did surveying 33 cities across this country and their readiness to contend with a chemical or a biological disaster. One thing you need to keep in mind when you think about what the federal government can do to help this country get prepared for this type of an event is that all emergencies are local and that the lives that are saved will be lives saved by local rescuers. And if you need to understand that point, remember what happened on September the 11th at the Pentagon and at the World Trade Center. It wasn't some federal rescue team that swooped in. It was the local firefighters, police, EMS, and physicians. And if you are to get this country ready, I would encourage you to get the domestic preparedness program back on track. The initial intent of this program was to get the locals ready. But last year, out of $8.7 billion spent in this program, only $311 million went to readiness in our communities across this country. So with that, I see my time's up. I would be delighted to elaborate on the lessons that I learned in my survey from many people who I consider to be much more authoritative than myself. I have questions from our colleagues on both sides, and uh, so stick with us. Uh, now I'd like to uh, 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 give uh, a welcome uh, by uh, Mr. Ehrlich, the uh, a very uh, able person in representing the city and states of uh, Maryland. And uh, he is going to introduce the mayor of Baltimore and the commissioner of the Baltimore City Police. And uh, that's bipartisan because they're, Mr. Ehrlich is a Republican. <laughs> The, uh, I don't, yes, they've only had a one Republican mayor, as I remember, uh, and it's been all Democratic, so we're glad to have you here. And the same for the chief. So, Mr. Ehrlich. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, Ranking Member Chikowski and Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, on July 18th, we, th we thought at the time we had a major incident, and certainly for, for Baltimore, Maryland, it was major. Uh, that day, a 60-car CSX freight train traveling to Oak Island, New Jersey, derailed under Howard Street in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, subsequent fire sent uh, smoke billowing out of both ends of the tunnel, cloud over Camden Yards. Uh, fire caused the water main breaks in the tunnel, literally flooding streets above. The entire city was shut down. The United States Coast Guard <laughs> shut down the Inner Harbor. 30,000 fans were removed from uh, Camden Yards. Intense heat fire were a problem, preventing our firefighters from initially getting to the flames. Our city's police and fire department worked together uh, with the mayor's office around the clock for the next few days, and the fire was subdued. It was a total team effort and a, uh, in a dire situation, a wonderful example of what cooperation can do. In the aftermath of September 11th, uh, our city under the mayor's leadership has done some things that could not have been thought of three weeks ago. We've hired a former United, uh, New York City Police Department official to come up with a terrorism plan, which the mayor, I'm sure, will talk about. We beefed up security at city government buildings and around Penn Station. We brought, even brought barges in to protect Baltimore's own uh, World Trade Center. Uh, emergency medical personnel are now connected to major emergency rooms online with what uh, Mayor Malley calls our first real-time reporting system. That will help our health department track any unusual spikes in cold and flu systems that might warn of an attack. I really appreciate these two uh, gentlemen, uh, friends of mine, great public servants, taking the time to come to speak to our committee, to our Congress, to our nation today. 
Uh, both are proactive, both are forward-thinking, both are aggressive, both are thoughtful, both understand the dimension of the problem that they particularly face today. Uh, they need, they have to have cooperation from the federal government, all agencies of the federal government. I had the opportunity to talk to Commissioner Norris and the mayor prior to this hearing. <clears throat> if the message in the past has been you protect your turf, we'll protect ours. Those days are long gone. And let the message go out from September 11th forward that that sort of mindset is no more and cannot be the case in this new world we live in. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to welcome my two friends and true leaders in a time of uh, great national emergency. Mayor Martin O'Malley, Police Commissioner Ed Norris. Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, uh, Mayor O'Malley. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Congressman Ehrlich, for, for uh, your introduction and, and um, for being part of this, this committee's hearings today. I want to thank you for the opportunity to join you today in, as we all try to struggle with this new unconventional war, which I would submit to you is one that's being fought on two fronts. One of those fronts is far away from American soil. We have our soldiers on the ground. We have the best technology, the best and most rapid uh, communication system to forward intelligence to them so that they can accomplish their mission. The other front is the one that all of us sadly witnessed in New York City and also in Washington. It is a front where we have already sustained many, many casualties, uh, not only civilian casualties, but also casualties among our first responder, local fire, and police officers. And while much of the discussion and grief has been about the 6,000 lives lost, we should not lose sight of the fact that thanks to preparedness, thanks to the efficiency and bravery of those first responders, there were about 40,000 lives that were saved. And that's really the, the key to all of us who are in big cities. You know, Baltimore is, is not um, unlike many other large cities in America in terms of what we need to be doing right now as quickly as possible to protect as many lives as possible in our cities in the event that there are other attacks on our population centers. We're not the largest city, but we're not the smallest either. And we take our responsibility very, very seriously since we consider ourselves truly to be on the front of one of the two fronts in, in this war. Uh, Baltimore, however, is in a unique position because of our proximity and history to come up to speed very quickly. And we've done that, and special thanks to Mark Morial and the Conference of Mayors for the work that they're doing to help all of us share best practices with one another. Any of you who know American history, uh, and this, particularly the War of 1812, know that Baltimore does not wait for advice from Washington when it comes to matters of self-defense. <laughs> Indeed, if we had, we would all be singing God Save the Queen still. So we have moved forward ourselves and, so, and we're very lucky to have been able to have some um, great resources around us. Some of you may know that Baltimore was selected as a lead city in the Chemical Warfare Improved Response Program uh, due to our proximity to Washington and also our proximity to the U.S. Army Soldier and Biological Chemical Command in Aberdeen, Maryland. Also, Baltimore's home to the only Center for Civilian Biodefense Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And you'll shortly hear from our police commissioner, Ed Norris, formerly of the New York City Police Department, where they had done extensive work on civil preparedness uh, in the wake of the first World Trade Center bombing. Uh, and finally, I guess, there, as Congressman Ehrlich mentioned, one of, we had an emergency just back in July that was a chemical emergency. It shut our city down for about five days, and Baltimore had a chance to test our readiness in a chemical incident when a CSX train loaded with toxic chemicals derailed and burst into flames, burning in a mile-long tunnel that ran directly beneath our city. And uh, the fire w th that was uh, in the southern end of that tunnel, and it happened in the middle of a doubleheader at Camden Yards, which is located right at that exit of the tunnel. Now, during that train fire, as is the case in virtually any crisis, local government was the first on the scene. In fact, the folks from the NTSB located down here in Washington, a mere half hour drive away, mm -hmm. did not show up until the next morning. Local government is the first on the scene. And one thing that's immediately apparent is that you have to set up 
a unified command structure. And that command structure, in this case, was under our fire chief. It was effective. We coordinated fire, police, health, uh, State Department of the Environment, as well as uh, the Coast Guard and uh, our State Department of Transportation. And it all went very well. Key to this was also that the governor ordered the state agencies to defer to the local unified command structure. And based on our experience, we learned a few things. Um, and important things everybody should be asking. Where are your, who are your critical personnel? Where is the command center? Uh, what is the unified command? Do you have redundant communications? Uh, are you talking to the public so that the public maintains a, an appropriate level of alert? What do your mutual assistance agreements set into motion? Uh, at the same time, as, as well as our emergency folks handled that, that uh, particular incident, when we watched it with horror, with all Americans, of what happened in New York and in Washington, we realized we needed to do more. We need to do more. And uh, we've set about doing several things on three different fronts, if you will, and every city in America needs to be doing this. On those fronts, are the uh, three break down just in a thumbnail into security, emergency preparedness, and intelligence. And I'm going to defer to Commissioner Norris to talk to you about the most most worrisome one of all of those to me, which is the criminal intelligence. Um, on security, we've been able to recruit from New York City Chief Lou Amon, and we have been um, taking a series of steps to improve our preparedness, looking at public buildings, looking at public infrastructure, looking at private infrastructure. It is absolutely alarming the, the um, degree to which our rail system is open to everyone. I'm talking, and we're not unlike many other big cities. And when you think of the amount of chemicals, armaments, and other things that move along our rail system, uh, that's clearly some place where we could use some federal help in, in pushing greater security measures. But we're looking at all of those sorts of things. As I said, the public bu buildings as well as the private infrastructure, bolstering police and security presence at water supplies. On the, um, on the emergency preparedness, uh, we are uh, continuing to coordinate with the Center for Civil Biodefense. We've worked with all of our hospitals so that the ones who had bioterrorism plans have now shared them with their colleagues. Um, and, and on the intelligence front, we have created a biosurveillance system in a matter of just two short weeks where we make sure that in real time we're looking at the symptoms being displayed in our emergency rooms, uh, in our clinics. Uh, that our paramedics are seeing. We're watching the numbers of dead animals that our animal control people pick up, and we're looking at absentee rates. It's simple. It hasn't cost millions and millions of dollars, and the hospitals were willing to do it with local leadership. Uh, so we actually do have a pretty good intelligence network set up to identify it early. I'm, my time's running out, and uh, I'm going to wrap up and, and defer to Commissioner Norris to go to the more worrisome side of this. But an, in conclusion, I just want to again emphasize, as the doctor did before me, that I think we have models that work, like the Chemical Warfare Improved Response Program. Those models involve direct local funding. You have to get the help to the first responders. And the first responders are not the states. They are the cities. Direct local funding to the cities. I could talk to you at greater length about our equipment wants and desires, our vaccination wants and desires, and things of that nature. And, and all of them are concerns. And none of us are where we want to be, uh, where we hope to be. But the biggest concern of all of these is the lack of criminal intelligence, the lack of a connection between the 3,000 local law enforcement officers under my command in the city of Baltimore and the 200 or so FBI agents who cover the entire metropolitan area. And I'd ask you to. Um, to do whatever you can on, on that front. Because again, this is a war on two fronts. One, where we don't skimp, where we have the best technology, the best communication, and the best intelligence rushing to the front line. And another one, which is our local front, where none of those things are rushing to the front lines of major city fire and police departments. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor. I think you've given an outstanding uh, thinking and results. And uh, that would be good advice for every mayor in the country. And uh, I'm hopefully at your various national conferences, I would hope that uh, you and some of the other mayors uh, get that through your uh, uh, fellow mayors. 
and uh, as to the FBI, uh, we will certainly be making some recommendations uh, on that one to the Attorney General, because I know exactly what you're talking about. Commissioner, it's great pleasure to have you with us, and uh, uh, we're delighted to have you. Now, you are in charge of the city police department, and I take it there's a separate fire department. Yes, sir. Because I would certainly like what you know about the hired fire department and what they did would be very helpful in the record. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ehrlich, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the chance to talk with you today. The subcommittee has heard Mayor O'Malley describe the many steps being taken to carry out his responsibility for the overall safety and security of Baltimore. As police commissioner, I'm the individual responsible for the, to the mayor for preventing criminal actions that could lead to the loss of life and property. I'd like to focus on just one area he has mentioned, the area of collaboration and contact between the federal authorities and local law enforcement. There's been much discussion about the disconnect among federal agencies that share responsibility for homeland security. What has not been discussed is the disconnect between federal and local law enforcement. My main point to you today is that I believe all levels of law enforcement must do a dramatically better job of collecting and sharing intelligence. If we don't, the chances are much greater that terrorists can operate at will and cause even bigger disasters in our country. Neither we nor any other local law enforcement agency we know of has been asked to contribute manpower in any broadly coordinated way. For example, there are thousands of leads related not only to the September events, but to the continuing threats the Attorney General has repeatedly warned us about. Local law enforcement has the manpower to follow up on a very high volume of leads. The federal agencies do not. For example, the FBI has a total of 11,533 agents. There are nearly 650,000 police officers in this country. We want to help, and I think the nation needs us to help. To prevent other terrorist incidents, pressure needs to be brought to bear on anyone who may be planning any attacks. Local law enforcement, not federal agencies, are in daily contact with literally millions of people every day. The NYPD, the department where I spent most of my career, in the last year as a deputy commissioner in charge of operations, has over 10 million documented interactions with citizens. Those include arrests, citations, field interviews, stop and frisk. They don't include the millions of other discussions officers routinely have with citizens. We deal on a daily basis with a network of registered informants. We can debrief prisons about suspicious activities that may be terrorist in nature at the same time we debrief them about traditional crimes. But we have to know what the FBI knows about threats, tips, and even just rumors. We have to know more about what there is to look for in our own communities so we can protect our own people and be more effective gatherers of intelligence for the FBI. While the FBI has done nothing to prevent us from doing this work on our own, they have given us nothing but a watch list to go on. In the week after the attack, the watch list had names, a few dates of birth, no addresses, no place of employment, no physical descriptions, and no photographs. By Friday of the same week, we got a revised list which contained more information, but still no pictures. I do not understand this. When someone commits a murder, rape, robbery, he plasters picture all over police stations and whenever possible in the media to help locate the individual before he commits another crime. Now we're looking for the murders of thousands who may become the murders of millions. Why aren't we all looking, working together to find the people the FBI is looking for? In short, I think the rules of engagement for law enforcement have changed forever inside this country. It may have once made sense for federal agencies to withhold from local police their information about developing cases. Today, we all need each other if we as a nation are going to successfully counter threats that can come from virtually anywhere, at any time, in any form, including those that could destroy whole cities. To prevent recurrences of terrorism, which could drive this nation to panic and economic collapse, I believe we must do the following. Federal agencies must share all locally relevant information with the nearly 650,000 state and local police officers who could be helping them today, but who for the most part are not. Police chiefs should receive regular briefings on even highly classified information to help those chiefs better direct their own internal intelligence and counter-terrorist efforts. The Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, CALEA, which was passed in 1994, but has never been fully implemented, must be enforced. CALEA requires telephone companies to ensure their systems and networks can accommodate federal, state, and local wiretaps in the face of changing telephone technology. Right now, we can't intercept certain digital telephone technologies, and that is keeping all of us dangerously in the dark. In short, we must do all in our collective power, not only to locate the collaborators of last month's hijackers, but also to deter all terrorists from operating against our still vulnerable transportation systems, infrastructure, and people. I think the threat is so great, we should use every police officer in America in this fight. Excuse me. Like hundreds of firefighters in New York, my fellow officers at the NYPD show their willingness to give their lives to save others. My officers in Baltimore are ready to do the same. 
I think we must be allowed to help. I believe the life of the nation may depend upon it. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, our, we're going to go through the next three and then one more, and uh, then we'll go into Q&A. Uh, so, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch is the Emergency Management Director, Shawnee City and Pottawatomie County in Oklahoma, former Emergency Management Director, Oklahoma County in Oklahoma. So. Uh, Mr. Lynch, we're delighted to have you here. You went through the experience of uh, the uh, federal building that was wiped out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member Schakowsky, to the other honorable members of this committee, it's a great pleasure for me to come before you today to discuss these preparedness efforts for chemical and biological terrorist attacks in our country. Uh, first, let me say that all Oklahomans, but especially my fellow emergency managers and allied emergency services personnel, extend our deepest compassion and prayers to the emergency workers, victims, family members, and citizens of those communities affected by the attacks on September 11, 2001. Every emergency worker in Oklahoma was ready to come to the aid of those communities impacted to repay in some small way the support that you gave us in the Murrah Building incident. While we wanted to respond physically, we knew that our presence would create an unnecessary logistical burden on the community. Therefore, we have sent our support financially, spiritually, and emotionally to our brothers and sisters in New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. We shall continue to do so as long as there is a need, and we will always remember the heroism displayed in those communities. I think it's important to point out, as the colleagues on the panel have done, that a lot of work has been done in the last six years to prepare our communities. Among those activities are state and local emergency operations plans have been modified to include terrorism preparedness activities and mirror the federal response plan. Number two, state and local emergency exercises have been changed to incorporate response forces working in and around terrorist activities. Number three, national, regional, state, and local training programs have been created which integrate personnel from all levels of government, the private sector, and voluntary agencies active in disaster. And number four, Communities have received limited federal and state support for equipment to use in response to these terrorist events. The non luger Amenity Act uh, was a good starting point. However, somewhere along the way, the good intentions got slightly skewed under the federal bureaucracy. Both Oklahoma City and Tulsa, Oklahoma were on the list of the 120 cities to receive this training. In my capacity at the time, I participated in activities for both communities. The actual training itself was outstanding. It was relevant. It was useful. However, getting there uh, was inefficient. There were a lot of meetings that were held prior to the actual training itself. And in fact, when it came down to doing the training and providing the equipment caches, what was promised was not delivered. And I think probably that's because the money went towards meetings instead of towards actual uh, training programs. Uh, all the quality training in the world, Mr. Chairman, as you've heard from everybody here, all the plans that are prepared are not valuable. If you don't have the tools, you've trained on to respond with, and if you don't have the capability to sustain and augment that training. Both Oklahoma City and Tulsa were kind enough to include their neighboring federal, state, and local jurisdictions in the training programs. This not only helped spread the training to additional communities, but it helped foster teamwork and continuity of operations across jurisdictional boundaries. Additionally, the FBI, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the U.S. Public Health Service have all sponsored outstanding training programs that have helped communities achieve a higher level of preparedness. Most of these programs have been open to participants from all disciplines. However, we need more equipment. I cannot emphasize this enough. While non luger Dominici provided some minimal equipment and prior hazardous materials training encouraged larger communities to equip firefighters to respond to potential chemical emergencies, many communities across this country, and particularly in the heartland, simply do not have all of the equipment that would be needed in a chemical or biological attack. I propose the following recommendations. Number one, funding for the assistance to the firefighters program of the Federal Emergency Management Agency should be at least doubled for federal fiscal year 2002, and an increased reauthorization for federal fiscal years 2003 through 2007 of at least one billion per year should be passed. Number two, more pharmaceuticals are needed to be stockpiled. The current stockpile maintained by the Department of Health and Human Services is dangerously insufficient to handle more than two simultaneous events. Local communities need to be able to readily access these equipment caches within their jurisdiction. We can't wait for eight hours or more for a supply to be flown in. 
and the capability has to be developed at the local level. While there's great technical expertise at the federal level, wheels up six hours for a technical support team will not make it in those critical first few hours. So we have to develop this capability across our country. In summary, Mr. Chairman, I believe that our communities should not be characterized in terms of gloom and doom. We have done a lot to help. The federal and state governments have done a lot to develop emergency management systems. Uh, likewise, the situation should not be characterized as ship shape. While the foundation has been laid, now is the time to build upon that foundation. The recommendations I have mentioned in this testimony and in my written prepared remarks, I believe, will guide us on a proper path to enhancing our preparedness and servicing our citizens. We recognize that true emergency management requires a partnership between the federal, state, and local governments, business and industry, individuals and families, and voluntary organizations active in disaster. While we at the local level are ready to do all that we can to support the war against terrorism, we stand firmly behind the President and the Congress, and we eagerly anticipate your assistance in this war. I thank you for your willingness to investigate this matter and to help us with the task ahead, and I thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. We'll look forward to, to you in the question period. We now have Honorable Diana Bonta, uh, the Director of the Department of Health Services for the State of California. And before that, she was Director of the City of Long Beach's excellent uh, health <laughs> services, which is very rare for uh, most cities in America. So, Dr. Bonta. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this morning. In addition to serving as the director of the California Department of Health Services, I'm the immediate past chair of the executive board of the American Public Health Association as well. And thank you very much, Congressman Horn, for your ongoing support of local public health programs. Since the tragic events of September the 11th, national security has become our national concern. In California, Governor Gray Davis has led the creation of the California Anti-Terrorism Center, which will enable all law enforcement agencies to share information on terrorist threats and activities. Additionally, the Governor's Office of Emergency Services coordinates and responds to all types of hazards, including a biological or chemical terrorism event. OES facilitates and coordinates statewide efforts in planning and response by bringing together federal, state, local, nonprofit organizations and key infrastructure officials through various forums, such as the State Strategic Committee on Terrorism and Threat Assessment Committee, of which the Department of Health Services is a member. Also note, Governor Gray Davis has mobilized the California National Guard now to increase security at key airports. In the aftermath of the terrorist attacks, there has been heightened awareness of potential biological and chemical threats to our communities, and many have asked, is the nation prepared for a biological or chemical attack if such a horrific event were to occur? The safety, certainly, of every man, woman, and child would depend on the public health system. This system must remain strong. Traditional public health activities have focused on preventing the spread of communicable diseases and ensuring the safety of the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, and the food that we eat. More recently, public health efforts have expanded to include disease prevention activities to promote healthier lives. It's a big job, and it's done very well. Now, in addition to all of our other responsibilities, the public health system is faced with the potential intentional spread of disease public health resources would be significantly challenged following a biological or chemical attack. In recent years, public health systems in the nation's largest cities have become more involved in terrorism planning and preparedness using funds appropriated by Congress. Under this program, the nation's 120 largest cities, including 18 in California, have received funds for training, exercises and equipment to enhance their capability to respond to incidences involving weapons of mass destruction, including biological or chemical terrorism. The program trains first responders, the firefighters, police, emergency management teams, and medical personnel who will be on the front lines in case of any of these attacks occur in a U.S. city. In addition, this effort has enhanced, has been enhanced over the past several years by funding 
from the Department of Health and Human Services, allowing for the development of the Metropolitan Medical Response System in a dozen California cities. These funds have provided an essential first step in, de in developing a coordinated response to bioterrorism that involves enforcement, law enforcement, public health, and the medical communities. In 1999, the Centers for Disease Control and, Pre and Prevention, CDC, developed the Chemical and Biological Terrorism Response and Preparedness Program. California and several other states and large municipalities were awarded five-year funding to develop responses and preparedness plans, concentrating on five areas, which I'll summarize, as preparedness and planning and readiness assessment, surveillance and epidemiology capacity, laboratory capacity both for biological agents as well as chemical, and our health alert training system. These grants were intended to kickstart all of this preparedness at both the state and local health department levels, and California received $2.5 million per year to develop the program. We were the only applicant to be funded in all five areas in the country, and Los Angeles County, in addition, received $900,000 to assist them. Since the start of this program, certainly California has made great strides in both in preparation for biological and chemical terrorism. And I can tell you that we've uh, recently had training, for instance, in California. Just this week, we had forums that involved uh, hospitals, uh, first responders, public health individuals, so that we would have additional training. I'll summarize then that we need to continue to strengthen our systems uh, throughout the state. And first, first and foremost, we need additional resources to ensure that the federal, state, and local public health infrastructure is strengthened. Bioterrorism bio knows no state boundaries. With additional resources, we would do the following. We would improve existing surveillance systems at the local level, especially at the local level. We would further coordinate state and local planning activities. We would provide ongoing technical training for state and local staff and for the primary care provider community in recognizing symptoms, treatment protocols, and prophylaxis involving bioterrorism agents. We would conduct ready responsiveness and risk assessment of the public health system through coordinated exercises. We would expand the laboratory capability in chemical detection. We would further develop prevention strategies. Risk assessments must be conducted in many areas, such as food services, food production, nuclear and chemical industries, and water supply systems. Currently, California is developing a guidance document for growers, food distributors, and food service industry that in regarding hazard assessment. And lastly, to evaluate the legal and regulatory statutes to determine whether they provide sufficient authority for appropriate action during an emergency. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate your dedication to protecting the American public from these terrible threats and the opportunity that you've given me today. I encourage the subcommittee to do everything possible to support federal funding and assist us in these programs at the state and the local level. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And now we have uh, uh, Janet uh, Heinrich, uh, who is the Director of Health Care and Public Health Issues, United States General Accounting Office. Again, the General Accounting Office is the programmatic reviewer for the legislative branch, and uh, we're delighted to uh, have Dr. Heinrich here. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss our ongoing work on public health preparedness for a domestic bioterrorist attack. Last week, we did release a report on federal research and preparedness activities related to the public health and medical consequences of a bioterrorist attack on a civilian population. I'd like to begin by giving a brief overview of the findings in our most recent report and then address weaknesses in the public health infrastructure that we believe warrant special attention. We identified more than 20 federal departments and agencies as having a role in preparing for responding to the public health and medical consequences of a bioterrorist attack. These agencies are participating in a variety of activities from improving the detection of biological agents 
in developing new vaccines to managing a national stockpile of pharmaceuticals. Coordination of these activities across departments and agencies is fragmented. <clears throat> Our staff are struggling over there with a chart that we have prepared uh, that gives examples of efforts to coordinate these activities at the federal level as they existed before the creation of the Office of Homeland Security. I won't walk you through the whole chart. Certainly, if you have questions, we'll try to answer them. But as you can see, a multitude of agencies have overlapping responsibilities for various aspects of bioterrorism preparedness. Bringing order to this picture will be a challenge. Federal spending on domestic preparedness for terrorist attacks involving all types of wep weapons of mass destruction has risen 310% since fiscal year 98 to approximately $1.7 billion in fiscal year 2001. Funding information and research and preparedness of a bioterrorist attack, as reported to us by these federal agencies, generally shows increases from year to year, uh, but from a generally low level in 1998. For example, within HHS, CDC's Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Program first received funding in fiscal year 99. Its funding has increased from approximately 121 million to about 194 million in fiscal year 2001. While many of these activities are designed to provide support for local responders, inadequacies in the public health infrastructure at the state and local levels may reduce effectiveness of the overall response effort. Our work has pointed to weaknesses in three key areas, training of health care providers, communication among the responsible parties, and capacity of hospitals and laboratories. Because physicians and nurses in emergency rooms and private offices will most likely be the first uh, health care providers to see patients following a bioterrorist attack, they need training to ensure their ability to make astute observations of unusual symptoms and patterns and report them appropriately. Most physicians and nurses have never seen cases of diseases such as smallpox or plague, and some biological agents initially produce symptoms, such as the ones I have today, <coughs> of in, uh, colds, influenza, other common illnesses uh, that are very much uh, like um, the, these other uh, more vir virulent diseases. In addition, physicians and other providers are currently under-reporting identified cases of diseases uh, to the infectious disease surveillance systems. Because <clears throat> the pathogen used in a biological attack could take days or weeks to identify, good channels of communication among the parties involved is absolutely essential to ensure as rapid a response as is possible. Once the disease outbreak has been recognized, local health departments will need to collect uh, information, collaborate closely with personnel across a variety of agencies, and bring in needed expertise and resources. Past experiences with infectious diseases uh, and the response have revealed a lack of sufficient and secure channels for sharing information. Our report last year on the initial West Nile virus outbreak in New York City found that as the public investigation grew, lines of communication were often unclear, and efforts to keep everyone informed were cumbersome. Uh, we've also heard people speak to the need for laboratory capacity and hospital capacity. We have seen the patient load of regular influenza season patients overtax primary care facilities, and emergency rooms and metropolitan areas are routinely filled and unable to accept patients in need of urgent care. In conclusion, although numerous bioterrorism-related research and preparedness activities are underway in federal agencies, we remain concerned about weaknesses in the public health and medical preparedness uh, at the state and local levels. And Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, have uh, one uh, individual who has a problem, and uh, it's uh, General uh, Peak uh, is the Surgeon General of the Army, and uh, uh, his uh, presence in the uh, answering and uh, questioning is very important for going through the panel we have just heard. 
And so if we can, the clerk can get a chair for the general over here at the table, uh, we will. Uh, Okay, General, if you want to uh, give us your uh, presentation, and then we'll start uh, with our colleagues here on the uh, questions. And well, Mr. Chairman, Congresswoman Schakowsky, distinguished members, on behalf of Dr. Clinton, I thank you for the invitation to represent military medicine here today. The military health system really has a long history of supporting our nation in time of domestic emergency. That ability comes as a byproduct of our readiness to support our military in the defense of our country and in the protection of vital interests. That mission requires active and guard and reserve medical soldiers trained to standard, prepared to work in austere and demanding environments with an understanding of the spectrum of threats that could be faced on the battlefields of the world, endemic diseases, trauma, chemical or biological or nuclear threats. They train to work as teams in a task organized manner with leaders who not only have technical skills, but organizational and planning skills that come through a progressive development process. They represent all of the skills of an integrated healthcare delivery system. They have equipment that can be moved as part of a self-sustaining task force and still provide high quality and reliable medical care in austere and harsh conditions. They have the backup of world-class laboratory support, access to unique capabilities such as aeromedical isolation teams, bioprotection for containment facilities, and world-class medical centers that are integrated through an air evacuation system that we practice. The written testimony that has been submitted by Mr. Deering describes in some detail the supporting role that we in the military have to FEMA and the Federal Response Plan, and more particularly to the Public Health Service under Emergency Support Function 8. We can smoothly integrate into the incident command structure that is quite universally accepted in this country. We can task organize to bring individuals with special expertise or teams with special capabilities, preventive medicine, mental health, facilities engineers, or major units such as a hospital or a, med a medical task force such as we had at Hurricane Andrew with a medical helicopter evacuation, primary care, hospitalization, a logistics battalion, a major military medical command headquarters commanded by a general officer. That joint task force uh, civil support is now a standing organization that can serve as an integrator of military assets assigned to include such medical units. The most important thing that we bring though is where I started and in, that is the dedicated, trained and motivated soldiers like the National Guard soldier in New York who walked several miles from her office to her home, changed into her uniform and then went to where she knew her unit was supposed to go in emergencies. She did not have to be called, she was trained, and she just went. Charlie Company, 342nd Forward Support Battalion, New York Guard, was part of the immediate setup for emergency response because she lived there. She was part of that community. The 101st Cav, New York Guard, was the first medical unit deployed to the disaster site on the 11th. They provided care to fellow guardsmen for things like respiratory distress and eye injuries, keeping the rescue effort going. And within 11 hours of the incident, one of our new, new New York Guard civil support teams under the control of the governor had not only moved from Albany, New York, but uh, to New York City, but had gathered and tested environmental samples from ground zero, coordinated with the local, the federal, the state officials, and were able to deem the site clear of nuclear chemical and biological contaminants. That sure made a positive impact on those that were working in that uh, ongoing rescue effort. At the Pentagon, active units were augmented by reserve units working with the incident commander on the scene. Sergeant Delgado of the 311th Quartermaster Company from Puerto Rico was at the Pentagon leading his squad by 16 September, absolutely professional in the tough duty of recovering remains. I'm proud of the trained and ready soldiers of all of our components, their professionalism honed through training for support of our wartime fighting mission provides a tremendous asset to augment the local response, the state response, the federal response to chemical or biological attack here at home. I must tell you that your support of a robust military medical system is so important to keeping this capability. It is our direct care system that provides the training platforms where these soldiers of all components get their initial set of skills. 
and it is in that direct care system that skills are honed and maintained for the active force. And it is in those research laboratories, like those you've already heard mentioned, USAMRID, our Institute for Infectious Disease, that world-class scientists can examine militarily relevant medical threats, which unfortunately now are civil relevant medical threats, and be available on a moment's notice to support this nation. So I thank you for the chance to be here today and for your support of military medicine. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to know for the uh, record, uh, in terms of the military hospitals, uh, have we got compacts in any way uh, where there would be, uh, say, the FEMA for the state governor and then the FEMA, uh, a smaller one, is often there in a county such as Los Angeles with uh, 10 million people uh, in Los Angeles County, as well as uh, to have also Los Angeles City. And uh, something like this happens, and uh, there's veterans hospitals, obviously. If in the case of Washington, uh, you have a very fine uh, uh, hospital here in the terms of uh, Washington, uh, but we also have a world-class uh, uh, hospital known as Walter Reed yes, Medical Center. And uh, then you also have the Navy's uh, Bethesda. Uh, is there any uh, thing we've worked out with the cities, with the counties, uh, with the states that are adjacent, so forth? And would the military people take in the individual civilians uh, that uh, are either ill or gassed or whatever. How are you going to work that out and have you worked it out? Sir, it works through the, uh, as, as was mentioned, through the Incident Command Center. And so with the Pentagon, as an example, we had uh, our injured taken to many hospitals throughout, throughout the Washington, D.C. area. Some went to Walter Reed some to the Washington Hospital Center, to Arlington, to Nova, and so forth. Um, and they, are, they were dispersed by the Incident Command Center and the uh, emergency support. Almost every place that we have um, an, uh, an installation, there is an integration with the local community in terms of how that community would um, plan for dealing with an emergency or a disaster. I, I would agree that it varies across the country about how good that planning is, and there is room for improvement in that. But we are always integrated, and as you know, sir, under the Stafford Act, uh, the local installation commander can offer immediate response um, while we're waiting for the rest of the system to kick in. Yeah, as I recall in uh, California in 1906, the military were there to help on that uh, situation where you had an earthquake and then fires yes, sir. and then the gas pipes were broken and all that and the military were there to help on that. And the civilians uh, on this recent mess that the Pentagon uh, where this uh, terrorist uh, knocked out part of a wing, uh, a lot of fire companies I'm sure went to help you. They did, sir, and uh, and in fact, they they were in charge of that of that operation, and we subordinated ourselves uh, within. Uh, I happened to be on the cell phone with uh, one of my officers on en route to the Pentagon when he saw the plane go in. I was able to contact Walter Reed. We had uh, surgical teams en route by by the time the smoke was really starting to billow, but when we got there. The civilian response folks were there, tremendously professional, and we locked ourselves under them to be a part of the team effort. One of the problems is to get a proper laboratory to know what is this toxic that's a fair. Uh, do we have that pretty well in terms of your hospital system? Sir, we, uh, there's, there's a, a couple of answers to that. One, this um, civil support team that I referenced in my remarks, um, has that kind of capability, and it is a relatively new capability, and, and it worked pretty well in this instance. Uh, they are mobile, and they bring that equipment down. At the Pentagon, we brought from the Center for Health Promotion Preventive Medicine, immediately we launched some folks down to start sampling the air, soil, and water uh, in, that, in the Pentagon environment so that we could reassure 
A, know what was in the smoke and then reassure the 22,000 people that work there. Regarding the laboratory business, we have committed ourselves to integrate with the CDC's network of laboratories around the country and we are upgunning the laboratories in our uh, medical centers and the six medical centers that the Army has to link in uh, and, and be able to do the diagnostics on things like anthrax and brucellosis and so forth um, and do that networked with the CDC. Well, thank you. If you can stay with us for a while, yes, I want to uh, yield to the ranking member, Ms. Schakowsky, a uh, gentle lady from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd appreciate the opportunity to make a, a short statement and then to ask sure. a, a couple of questions. I really appreciate your holding this hearing today after the terrible events of September 11th and the panel that has been put together and I'm sure the next one as well is really excellent over the um, last couple of years the National Security Subcommittee on which I sit has participated in a number of hearings on this subject but none um, has been more useful or more meaningful than the one that we've uh, heard today with the, the witnesses that we've had the uh, honor of uh, hearing so far. Um, we've heard time and time again from experts from GAO and HHS and elsewhere that we need a comprehensive threat and risk assessment for chemical and biological attacks. Um, through this hearing today, we're developing a much clearer understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of our defenses. It's my desire that we reach an understanding that both reassures the public that they're safe and provides us clear guidance of the appropriate federal role in responding to the chemical and biological threats that may exist. Earlier this week, the Secretary of Health and Country was in fact prepared for any threat to our nation's health, but I'm not sure that I share his confidence. As some of our witnesses have explained, our public health system, good, good as, as it is, could have difficulty responding to a significant biological or chemical attack, not to mention even a major flu-like outbreak. The capacity of our public and private hospitals is strained each year during flu season. A disaster with 10,000 injuries that requires hospitalization could be very difficult for that system to handle. We must question whether our system could handle such a situation. The front lines uh, in most disasters, as we've heard so eloquently today, and I thank Dr. Smithson and uh, Mayor O'Malley and all the other witnesses for pointing this out so poignantly, is local government and local health care providers as well as state. We see this again and again as towns and cities are struck by hurricanes, tornadoes, and even disasters like we saw last month. The first there to tend to those in need are the local firemen, police officers, emergency medical personnel. Any response we develop now, as you have said, as our witnesses, must keep that fact in mind. Training and communications are key to disaster response and should be a major part of our planning and investment. We heard you. The majority of that investment should be made at the state and local level with an appropriate level of coordination and assistance from the federal government. Past experiences also show that the public health system is the second line of response. Once the disaster scene is surveyed, the injured are moved to hospitals. It is often the case that the hospital capacity is reduced by the same disaster. We've taken our public health system for granted for some time now, and it has suffered as a result. Community cooperation is the third line of response. Once the level of damage is assessed, those hardest hit will have to call upon their neighbors for assistance. As we saw after the events of September 11th, everyone wants to help. We need to develop a network of community organizations, much like that under, the devel under development by the Office of Emergency Preparedness at HHS. The goal is to provide every community with the preparation and resources to respond to a disaster. Those are just some of the many critical issues we'll need to assess and many others you outlined for us today as we move to improve the emergency response infrastructure in this country so we're able to address the current shortfalls and the possibility of future threats to uh, our health and security. I would really appreciate 
being asked, uh, being able to ask a, a few questions, Mr. Chairman. I want to make sure Dr. Smith and I heard you clearly. Were you saying in terms of crop dusters because there was some evidence that one of the terrorists at least was looking into the use of crop dusters, that the particles that would be distributed really are too big to cause any kind of health risk? Yes, you've got me exactly right. This is a very closed community. These are small businesses. One of the things that isn't being discussed today is really the fact that Atta didn't even get a peek inside the cockpit. These are people that are required to have a one-year apprenticeship just to learn how to fly these things and operate the sprayers behind them. And the sprayers would be suitable for chemical agent dispersal. I'm, I, I won't joke with you about that, but for biological agent dispersal, you'd have to go in there and change everything around. You can't even dial them down to the particle size required, very, very small particle size required for effective biological agent dispersal. But it could be useful for some sort of a chemical for a chemical, agent. That's, that that's right? what crop dusters do. Okay. But right. again, if you've just flown a, a regular light aircraft and the assumption is that somebody's going to jump into one of these things and get it successfully off the ground, uh, it would be the difference between driving a little Miata sports car and driving a couple of 18-wheelers hitched together fully loaded. Things handle differently. And there's no assurance that they'll crash, but they're not going to be able to operate these things automatically and cause the havoc that seems to be the assumption working in press circles today. No, but if someone were trained to do so, they were able to get the, the training and were to um, load it with some sort of a, a, a deadly chemical um, and f then fly it over some of a densely, a densely populated area, it could in fact be a, a problem. Is that not true? I would agree with you in that. But again, the assumption is that it would be effective. Um, in cities, there's micrometeorology that's going to come into play. These crop duster pilots are trained to go way down and lay something right on the earth and, and be effective in what they do. Um, we're making several leaps of logic right now, and, and everything appears to be very frightening. I would encourage you, just as I have done, to spend time with people who have actually made these weapons so that you understand how technically difficult it is, with people who actually fly crop dusters so that you have an appreciation about this. One of the things that's happening in this country is our citizens are getting their wits scared out of them by what they're hearing over the airwaves, often from people that don't seem to know their technical stuff. All right, you, you did mention hazardous chemical facilities and or hazardous so have you looked at all into um, nuclear power plants as a potential danger for a uh, terrorist attack? No, ma'am. My jurisdiction is chemical and biological. However, in the survey of 33 cities that I made, talking with individuals just like this, the locals are very aware. In fact, I, I defy you to find a hazmat captain who does not, not know off the top of his or her head how many of these facilities are in their communities. In most of the locations where I went, they had already a great appreciation of what these facilities were in terms of a danger to their citizens. Listen, the chemical industry takes the security of these sites very seriously, but so do the local responders around them. And in many cases, they had already begun working with these facilities and other locations like sporting arenas and major buildings, landmarks, to enhance the security of those sites. So there are things that are happening across this country in spots that will definitely protect Americans. What needs to be done here in the mindset that needs to be adjusted inside the Beltway is that the preparation needs to be nationwide and that you need to institutionalize the training, not just train here and there. Okay. That the federal government role is mid to long-term recovery assistance, not rescue. Because right now, you cannot fit any more rescuers on top of the rubble pile in New York City. And okay. if you threw every federal asset at it, it just wouldn't work. Well, then speaking, finally, then, speaking of federal assets, all of you have spoken about the need for federal assistance at the state and local level. Um, if we were with uh, our uh, finite resources to put to make a federal investment, what would you think is the most important thing? Let me just kind of, if we could quickly go down the panel, the most important investment we could make to guarantee the safety of our citizens for, against chemical and biological uh, threats. Why don't you go first? 
Or, I'm going to tell you that. We're going to be three minutes to these questions. Okay. okay. Institutionalist, institutionalization of the training in the nation's fire academies, police academies, medical and nursing schools, as well as in public health training. That's the only way you're going to raise the standard of readiness and preparedness across this country. Thank you. The, 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 I mentioned before, yes, about federal dollars. It doesn't take federal dollars. The, the, I, I really still do believe that for um, all of the other things we're talking about, that the disconnect in criminal intelligence is the biggest threat right now, frankly, and the most dangerous one. Um, but I would piggyback on that just to add the protective equipment and the additional vaccinations and stockpiles around. I agree with everything that's been said. Preventive equipment, stockpiles of vaccinations, but I can't stress enough that all these things are carried out by human beings. And what is missing right now is human intelligence. And while these things are very, very important to mitigate once a disaster strikes, I think we need to just as seriously take the intervention before they strike and be tracking down the people that are trying to deliver whatever may come in this country. And that is really lacking. I think most of, most of the discussion I've heard at the top levels regarding equipment, the biochem threat, nuclear threats, and the like, the choice of terrorists around the world is still bullets and bombs. Amen. The World Trade Center was done with a very low-tech operation, and we seem to be losing sight of that. We are missing human intelligence, and we need much more coordination with our federal counterparts to arrest the people out there right now who are in this country for over a decade preparing to do this. Let me add to that, and that is some people are out uh, getting uh, gas masks and all the rest of it. It's happened in Israel sometimes, mm -hmm. but also there have been deaths when the individual didn't pull the cord for oxygen. What's right. your advice on that? Well, it's very important, it's just as the mayor was saying before his statement, one of the most important things is to be prepared when an attack occurs, because a lot of, Dr. Smithson said it best, people are being terrified. And if air raid sirens go off in cities around America and people start to leave their homes when in fact maybe they should stay in place and things like that, and people are buying gas masks, gas masks when we have them, police departments and fire departments, they have to be tested to OSHA specifications for seals. You can put on a gas mask and still get killed if you run out the door because they don't fit properly. And people are misleading themselves and you know, it's giving them some sense of comfort. But from representing my city as the police chief, I still say we need to intervene in these acts before they occur. And, and you concentrate as much of our efforts that way as you are to the rescue efforts afterward. I can tell you that, that all 36 of the gas masks on stock in stores in the Baltimore area have sold out immediately. And, and none of them would do much good anyway when it comes to a biological attack. This is one of the aspects of the aftermath of 7, September the 11th that has saddened me the most. Americans have rushed to do things that they think will serve their interests when in fact that may not be the case. If this gas mask that you purchase is not fitted, and if you are not instructed in how to use it and understand the changing of the canisters and how to make sure it fits when you're running, then you've bought yourself some false protection. Let's use common sense. If you do see a crop duster overhead, get inside, shut the windows, shut the doors, and you will have provided some ample protection for yourself. And if you're still nervous about it, go jump into a shower. I mean, ask fire folks. One of the most effective decontaminants is water. In terms of stockpiling antibiotics, I'm sure that Scott Lillibridge will touch on this in just a few minutes. That's also false security. And it could backfire on Americans. If they start self-medicating themselves with the first dose of the case of the sniffles that they get this fall, the after effects could be that the medications won't work for them later when they really, truly need them. So uh, I know Scott will get to this too. I hope that America's physicians will get better educated on what is happening in the country and stop writing prescriptions right now. Any others you want to respond? <clears throat> Any others would like to respond? And I also wanted to just thank Mrs. Uh, McHale for that very dramatic uh, testimony and sharing that information and to say how happy I am. I was waiting to hear about your child being born healthy. <laughs> so. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address the question if I can. And, and it's really difficult to pinpoint down the one single actual thing that if we had to, to eliminate it to just one uh, because all the suggestions that have been here are good and, and we all have ideas that we think are important but if I had to narrow it down I would say making sure that we get the right equipment for response into the hands of the local first responders it's imperative that we have that we have to have good communications equipment we have to have good detection and surveillance equipment 
we have to good, have good personal protective equipment for those folks, too, if we expect them to be able to do their job. Let me uh, ask one question before I turn to Mr. Cummings, and that is uh, that uh, in the case of Baltimore, what was the toxic? And did you know how much, when did you first know which toxic it was, and had those individuals uh, had uh, violated the uh, rules of the Department of Transportation to note on the uh, storage there with the toxic so that the firemen going in would know, particularly under tunnels and right. so forth. So now, tell us a little bit about what was the toxic and uh, were they terrorists or were they just incidental accidents? Well, we have, on your last point, we have yet to um, have a cause determined by the NTSB. Uh, so we don't know what the cause of it was at this point. Uh, pardon me? The guy you just arrested. Uh, and recently we did arrest a, a person of Middle Eastern descent coming out of the tunnel with uh, camera equipment and a knapsack and, and a hood. And whether that person was a, a probe or or a, or a kid that didn't get enough love from his dad early in life, or, or what, you know, what that was, we don't know. But when this incident actually broke out and the fire and was happening inside this tunnel, keep in mind this tunnel, it was built in 1890s. It bankrupt the B&O Railroad. It was their last and greatest public works project, and it is almost like a mile and a quarter long brick oven with two entrances. We found a third one, only because of memory. So we knew right away from the manifest what was on the train. Uh, you can't be 100 percent sure that the people recording it on the manifest didn't make a mistake. So you really don't know what you're dealing with until you get inside and the order of things. Um, we, um, and, the, and the other curious thing was that although we knew what was on the train, without being able to get up inside the tunnel, we couldn't tell you where the fire was on the train. In retrospect, we were fortunate in that the people assembling the train had indeed put buffers between some of the chemical cars so that there was not a chain reaction. Uh, I mean, there was, of course, a chain reaction in that, you know, the chemical fire was adjacent to a, a car containing trash and garbage and packed paper. So there was a reaction, but not the sort of combustible reaction there would have been had all of the chemicals been uh, tied together. The, um, I, for, I forget, uh, the one that had actually exploded was tripropylene, um, and that was the uh, and that was the one that that had caused the fire. It ruptured uh, an adjacent car that had hydrochloric acid in it. Uh, where that uh, basically ran out, diluted, or or was burned. The other car, whose uh, polysyllabic chemical name escapes me at this time, uh, methyl ethyl bad stuff. We'll say for the sake of this uh, <laughs> hearing was fortunately at the other end of the car, and our great fear it was some sort of a, a chlorine agent. Our fear was that that would rupture, that that would somehow be in gaseous form and become a, a deadly gas. And that was fortunately at the other end. There had been a uh, uncoupling of the cars. So the cars that jumped off the rail where the fire happened, um, you know, kind of came to a rest quickly, the other half of the car continued to roll a little bit on the back of the engine, and so there was a separation of space. But keep in mind, when all of these suckers were pulled out of that tunnel late at night in front of uh, uh, our fire department and a very nervous mayor at about 2 a.m., they were all charred and looked like a bunch of hot dogs being pulled out of a fire. So I'm sorry, I can't tell you what exactly the bad one was. It was some sort of a chlorine agent. What is the situation of that particular tunnel or whatever? Not unlike other tunnels, including one, uh, you know, not like un unlike other tunnels in cities up and down the East Coast or rail yards or the tracks that go through them, uh, those tracks are very much open. They're open to pedestrians. I mean, fortunately, thanks to Commissioner Norris and our assessment of vulnerabilities, the reason we apprehended the individual coming out of that tunnel was because we were keeping an eye on that tunnel and had additional security, had spoken to uh, CSX. Uh, but it's, it's, um, there's, there's very little security around any of these rail yards. And while it's true, as the doctor said, that the chemical companies take the security of their chemicals 
very seriously. They take it so seriously that most of the dangerous tankers are left out open on the yard instead of coming inside their plant, inside the chain gates. So this is a serious vulnerability for a lot of cities, uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and many others along industrial cities along the, the corridor. We've identified it. Obviously, it's going to cost a bit of money to do the proper fencing, uh, to do uh, security cameras. Uh, the, the gentleman from the train company, as I asked him about great simple security measures like that, said, we have 23,000 miles of track in the United States, to which I answered, I'm sure you do. And which percentage of that track runs through America's 20 largest population centers? Now we thank you very much. And now I want to yield uh, three minutes to uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your uh, courtesy. And I'm certainly um, very pleased to welcome the mayor of Baltimore, uh, Mayor O'Malley, and certainly our police commissioner. Um, Mr. Chairman, the uh, mayor O'Malley has done an outstanding job. Uh, and I think his testimony today indicates uh, that Baltimore uh, is as prepared uh, as we can be, and we can always use some help. And I think the mayor would agree with me on that. We can use resources, and as we debate in the Congress about how we are going with these pocketbooks open and uh, dealing with this, these emergency circumstances, I think it's very important that we keep in mind that, as Mayor O'Malley has said, we are indeed on the front line of this. Um, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that I find so interesting and uh, coming from our police commissioner, Commissioner Norris, who too is doing an outstanding job in our city and crime rate has done, gone down dramatically, it is shocking to the conscience that the cooperation that he talked, the lack of cooperation between our federal agencies and our local police. Um, and, you know, uh, when we think about all that we have heard and all the concerns that we've heard uh, in the news media about how uh, the FBI, DEA, and all the other federal agencies, CIA, trying to track down uh, the criminal element, the terrorists involved in this matter, um, and not to, uh, to to, to not to be working closely with our local police is very, I mean, it should be, it should concern every single American uh, who uh, may be listening to this. And so one of the things that we will do, Mr. Chairman, uh, and the committee, subcommittee of this committee, which I rank on criminal justice, is I've asked uh, Chairman Sauter, and I hope that you will help me with this, uh, to convene a, uh, a subcommittee hearing or with the chairman of our overall committee, uh, Congressman Burton, to ask the FBI, to ask the, the uh, other uh, agencies, uh, federal government, law enforcement type agencies, why don't people like Commissioner Norris have the kind of cooperation that he wants to, to, to have? And uh, so I think that when we've got great police, and, and, we, and we saw, uh, saw it in, in, in New York, and we see it all over the country, People who work every day, they know their territories, just like uh, uh, Commissioner Norris just said. They know the people. They know every square inch of their cities. It just seems logical to me that uh, we would try to have that maximum cooperation. Finally, let me say this. Um, I think that when, when, as I've listened today, I hope that we understand. It sounds like when I listen to the mayor, what he's basically saying is, look, you know, let's not put a blinder up to our eyes and, and then and listen to Dr. Smithson, let's not put a blinder up to our eyes and act like one thing is going on when actually it's another. And that let's be practical and deal with these things. And I think that that's what, and I hope that we as in the Congress will listen to them very carefully because what they bring to us are the practical, first of all, the information that is accurate and then the practical solutions to the problems so that we will not be fooled. Uh, Americans, I think, uh, after September 11th, they thought they had a level of security, which we f quickly found out we didn't. And so um, the kinds of things that are coming forth today, Mr. Chairman, and again, I thank you, are the kind, is the kind of information we need to address the problems that we are confronting. And again, I thank you for your courtesy. Thank the gentleman. And I, as I said earlier today, uh, Mrs. Maloney, the gentlewoman from uh, New York, helped us on this as many other things and so I now yield three minutes 
we're going to just have to keep going because we want the second tier to come, and we'd love you to have th your role after you hear some of the second tier. So, Ms. Maloney. I, I, uh, later today, we will be authorizing the Intelligence Committee. And uh, I will certainly be bringing to the floor in my statements uh, the items that you brought on better coordination. We definitely need to invest in, and strengthen our, our, our intelligence. I, I'd like to uh, ask about uh, small smallpox. Um, many uh, people who are experts in this uh, tell me that there's a, a universal agreement that the smallpox virus is the single most dangerous raw material for a non-nuclear terror attack. Uh, one expert said it's almost like it's smallpox and then everything else. Uh, we eradicated it in 1978. It is supposed to exist, the virus, in two places, the CDC in Atlanta and in, in Russia. But I'm told by some experts that they believe that uh, many of these smaller countries have uh, the smallpox virus. Um, we know that uh, it could kill, or in the past has killed, up to a third of those infected. And uh, the World Health Organization is trying to uh, speed up responses. Our own government has roughly uh, 15 million doses of smallpox vaccine and has ordered 40 million more for delivery by the end of the year 2004. Uh, many of my constituents in New York have called my office and asked for the smallpox vaccine. I have called the National Institute of Health. They have told me that it is not available uh, many experts believe that it is a threat. Uh, Russia apparently developed weapons that could put the virus on the tip of it and uh, send it to our country. And we have not really had a great control of, 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 of some of their weapons after the Cold War. And I'd, I'd like to ask uh, some of our experts whether you think we should be developing more vaccine. Should our citizens have access to it? Uh, even though we don't have enough for everyone, shouldn't uh, some of the people that are asking for it uh, be able to have access to it? I, as a child, I was vaccinated, uh, but I am told that anyone who was vaccinated many years ago is no longer uh, covered or immune to a smallpox uh, virus. And I'd like uh, anyone on the panel who would like to comment uh, to comment on uh, uh, what we should be doing. Should we be developing more vaccine? Should we be distributing it? Uh, what should we be doing? Yes, doctor. A few years ago, I spent several weeks in the former Soviet Union interviewing the weaponeers who did this, who figured out how to turn diseases into weapons of war. And the Soviet Union did that with over 40 disease, excuse me, over 50 diseases, including Marburg. Now, it's true. They did weaponize small box and they manufactured tons of it and along with plague and anthrax and they put it on top of ICBMs aimed at Western population centers. And I think it would be foolhardy to assume that smallpox seed cultures only exist in one place in the former Soviet weapons complex, which consists of over 50 centers that were involved in the research, development, testing and production of these weapons. However, when I talked with the weaponeers, there was one thing that they understood very clearly. Terrorists, they kept on telling me, are our common enemy because Moscow has had its own encounter with terrorism. And also, before that ever even happened, Aum Shinrikyo, the cult in Japan, had knocked on the institute doors for both chemical and biological weapons knowledge. Now, I don't want to feed you a line here. I did interview weaponeers who knew colleagues who had gone to help Iraq and Iran and China and North Korea. They had been invited to teach, but let's not make the assumption that that may be all they had, that they did. Let's also not make the assumption that these governments would automatically share something like smallpox with a terrorist group, because if it's anything that a weaponeer understands, it's the consequences of unleashing something like that on a population, even if it's the population of your enemy, because that's something that goes around the world and would be very, very difficult to, to contain. Let's also not make the assumption that smallpox is for sale on the streets of Moscow or any other place. I mean, in today's environment, there's so many rumors that are floating around. If I were to give you a remark on your, 
on the other aspect of your question, it would be if anybody should be getting smallpox vaccine in an emergency, it has to be the very people who are going to be there. We are expecting them to save our lives. The medical personnel, both in hospitals and the paramedics and other technicians, as well as the firefighters and police. Should we be vaccinating them now, in your opinion? I think I'll leave that judgment call to, to others. It's not for me to advocate that. Um, I don't feel that there is imminent danger that smallpox is going to be released on this country. I think we, before we go doing a lot of knee-jerk things, and this is an atmosphere that breeds knee-jerk reaction, we need to carefully think through these matters. Um, and by the way, I agree with what Governor, uh, excuse me, uh, I just promoted you. I, Mayor O'Malley said. I accept said. your nomination. <laughs> <laughs> with what Mayor O'Malley said, it's not just the frontline personnel, it's also their families because they have to be assured that uh, their, their families are going to be okay if something bad happens. I think the long term issue of prophylaxing your emergency responders, though, mm -hmm. is. It's, mm -hmm. it's just that it's a slightly longer term issue, but it's a very right. important right. issue. You know, we assume that when the calls go out, everybody goes and they do their duty, and we've right. seen the courage, and, and, and many and most probably will, but, a lot, but to ask people to, in these sorts of things, to leave their families behind is a, is a tough thing to ask human beings to do in these times of emergency, but I would think that given the, uh, the level of vaccinations that we currently have, that to go doing them all over the country in a knee-jerk way would not be a wise use of the limited vaccines we have on smallpox. Right. And the thing is, we need to assure these people now what the priorities are going to be, that they would be the first to receive these medications simply because they'll have to save us. Well, can I ask one brief show of hands on one brief question, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would just like a show of hands because we have to get on to other people, as the Chairman said. Uh, of how many people agree with Secretary Thompson's statement that he stated on uh, 60 Minutes on Sunday, and I quote, we're prepared to take care of any contingency, any consequence that develops for any kind of bioterrorism attack. Do you agree with this statement of, of, of being prepared? Raise your hand if you agree you're prepared, that we're prepared for all of this. Raise your hand if you think we're not prepared. Well, wait a minute. I think wait. it's all a matter of degrees, Congresswoman. I think we're prepared for many, many things, and I think depending on the degree of it, we would quickly find that preparation outstripped by events. Yeah, I remember where the uh, previous administration had uh, warehouses all over the place on flu, and nobody ever used them. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need doctors to know and uh, chemists to know if any of this is there. Otherwise, I don't believe in uh, uh, mm -hmm. sort of uh, scaring the living daylights out of people. And uh, because I'd like Ms. Bonta to, uh, with yes, our, thank the, you, the nation's largest state. I, I think and, it is uh, dependent upon degrees because certainly uh, we have experience in the United States where some local public health departments are still in buildings that were made for the polio epidemic in 1988, when I was with the city of Long Beach, we were in just such a building. We had um, a rotary telephone, and we had um, two computers that uh, staff were even not fully trained in how to use. We've moved a long way throughout the country, and certainly in California, we have the advantage of having years and years of preparing for earthquake preparedness and other natural disasters, but this is a unique situation in which we need more work on communication, on training, on laboratory uh, preparedness, and uh, having disease surveillance and epidemiology. I just say, ma'am, that um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a doc, and so if you're the one doc in the ER and three or four people come in, that's a mass casualty. Uh, it, it, uh, it is a matter of degree, and the issue is having the systems back up that can pull the things together where you need it, when you need it, to be able to make that response. And I think that's sort of been a consistent theme as, as, as I've heard here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we thank you. And uh, our last uh, uh, questioning goes to Mr. Ken Jorsky, gentleman from Pennsylvania. Three minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to make a few observations to the panel because I'm, I've been sort of monitoring the channels 
over the last several weeks on television. It seems that anybody who's written a book lately uh, yeah. in the extreme has been a guest, and they make all these proposals. And then I've been talking to constituents that have a legitimate reason to trying to make an analysis and a judgment of how they should carry on their daily lives. And what I'm most interested in is the lack of uh, our system having a central clearinghouse operation to adequately inform people as to what the risks in various categories are, some, what the symptomologies are, and what the disadvantages of taking proactive action. Uh, one uh, member of the uh, health community made a, a great point the other day that vaccines, for instance, have a percentage of detrimental effects on society. And if you were to inoculate the entire country, even though it may be one half percent a negative effect, you're talking about a million and a half people that may uh, suffer uh, irreparable injury as a result of just taking the shot itself. A lot of people aren't aware of that. They think it's a sure cure. Mm -hmm. uh, the other things that they aren't aware of is the difficulty of delivery the longevity of life of these, some of these biotechnology uh, uh, methodologies that would be used in, in uh, uh, germ warfare, and also even in, in gas warfare, what, what, what the chances of getting the proper nozzles on a, trop, a crop duster. I guess what I'm most interested in, and, and the observation I would make over the last three weeks, is that we in government and in leadership have a tendency to underestimate the intelligence and rationality of the American people. Uh, they don't want even the Secretary of Health or, uh, of HHS uh, to come out and make a pronouncement. They want to know the basis on which his pronouncement was made so they can analyze in their own mind what their, 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 their chances of having an exposure would be. In order to bring the level of that type of understanding up. Are you aware of anything that we're doing to uh, create a national institute of reliability, if you will, for this information, whether it be on the internet? Should we do it in national broadcast? What's the educational factor here? Because it, we just have entirely too many people that are in a state of anxiety that shouldn't be there are giving up their normal course of life and business and having a, a major impact on our economy and other things. Now, I just came from a session, Mr. Chairman, where you know, we talked about security. And a after we got to 25 or $30 billion in expenses of changing railroad lines and doing all kinds of things, which are probably intelligent things to do, I realized that we, we could be on our way of spending ourselves into bankruptcy mm -hmm. in trying to uh, take care of every contingency that could happen, knowing fully well uh, the open country that we are, we can't accomplish that. So uh, it, it, do you have any ideas, I just asked the panel, what could we do to provide a level of intelligence and information that would meet the needs of the average American who wants to be informed as to what to do and do away with the rumor mills that are out there Matt. that are paralyzing? I think. Congressman, I think your point, um, I think it's, a, it's an excellent point. One of the things we've tried to do through the Conference of Mayors is inform each other and, and, and try to encourage uh, well-informed local officials to, to talk about these things. We had a teleconference with about 200 cities that chimed in, and our guest, and the first one was last week, and it was done with, uh, on bioterrorism, going through the likely agents. I mentioned the Hopkins uh, uh, Center for Civil Biodefense Studies. It's www.hopkins uh, hyphen, what is it? Biodefense.org, I think. Yep. How do you know that? You're onto these things. And we're going to be doing one next week on chemical readiness. I, it would probably be a good idea to have some sort of 800 number or something in cities that, that people could call. But I've, fortunately, I think the internet, I think you're right. I think a lot of Americans are educating themselves, but we need to do a better job. And I don't think it does any of us any good to not discuss this. I know there's some local elected officials who feel like, oh my goodness, if I go on camera or talk about this, um, uh, I might make it worse. Indeed, if they're uninformed, they may make the hysteria worse. So I think it's incumbent on us locally to get the word out and do it through our local affiliates. That's uh, very well 
answered. Um, I'd like to now play musical chairs where the group in the back uh, are panel two, and if some of you could uh, stay around, we would like that. And uh, let us start here with uh, Scott uh, Lillybridge, special assistant to Secretary Thompson. Second uh, one is Bruce uh, Bowman, FEMA. Uh, Craig During from the Department of Defense. Mr. Uh, Fogg, uh, New Hampshire Office of Emergency Management. Uh, Mark Smith, Washington Hospital Center. And Kyle Olson, Vice President, Senior Associate. Really think Thanks. <laughs> well, there. The idea about a joint information center is right on it. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Mr. Lullybridge, Mr. Borman, Mr. During, Mr. Fogg. Mr. Smith and Mr. Olson. Okay. We will uh, start uh, with uh, Mr. Scott uh, uh, Lillibridge, uh, MD, Special Assistant to the Secretary for National Security and Emergency Management, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, which is headed by uh, one of the best uh, cabinet members I've ever known, and that's Mr. Thompson. Uh, he's on top of it, and I'm delighted to have uh, one of his special assistants here. So, Mr. <coughs> Lillibridge, proceed to uh, give us a summary of uh, your excellent... Uh, all of you had uh, wonderful papers, and that automatically goes in the record. But uh, we'd just like uh, to see an overview from you at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am Scott Lillibridge, Special Assistant with the Secretary for Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, for National Security Issues and Emergency Management. I would like to, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the issues and the role in state and local government preparedness to respond to acts of terrorism, including biological terrorism and chemical terrorism. I'd like to take heart in the comments that I've heard to date from plain speaking Amy Smithson about uh, preparedness. Uh, the comments from Dr. Bonta about state and local preparedness in the public health sector, and, of course, Baltimore for taking matters into their own hands once again. Thank you. At any rate, I would like to acknowledge that our state and local public health programs comprise the foundation of an effective national strategy for preparedness and emergency response. Preparedness must incorporate not only the immediate responses to threats such as biological terrorism, it also must encompass the broader components of public health infrastructure, which provide the foundation for immediate and effective emergency responses. These components include, one, a well-trained, well-staffed, fully prepared public health workforce. Two, a laboratory capacity to produce timely and accurate results for, diagnostic, for diagnostics and public health investigations. Three, we need epidemiology or disease detective work, including surveillance for infectious disease, which provide the ability to detect health threats urgently. Four, we need secure, accessible information systems that can help us analyze essential information, communicate it rapidly, and, ap and analyze trends and interpret data. And last, of course, we need an effective communication system. I believe several members today talked about, spoke to the issue of important public health information and relating that accurately to the public. Currently, states lack an optimum public health infrastructure at both the state and the local level. We will need to discuss and make planning on the long term as part of our overall preparedness effort. I'd like to begin by talking about 
HHS activities and preparedness and response and start with the Centers for Disease Control activities. The HHS CDC has used funds provided, has provided funds for the past several years from Congress to begin the process of improving expertise, facilities, and procedures of state and local health departments to respond to biological and chemical terrorism and other acts of terrorism. For example, over the past three years, the agency has awarded more than $130 million in cooperative agreements to 50 states, one territory and four major metropolitan health departments and has created a bioterrorism preparedness response program and other components that anchor as part of that overall program, including stockpile, chemical preparedness, health information, and a health alert network. We must continue our work with our state and local public health systems to make sure they are more prepared. This will require interaction of state departments of health with state emergency managers to fully integrate the state's capacity to effectively distribute life-saving medications to victims, whether it be a biological or a chemical event. The HHS Office of Emergency Preparedness is also working on a number of fronts to assist local hospitals and medical practitioners to deal with the effects of biological, chemical, and other terrorist acts. Since fiscal year 1995, for example, the Office of Emergency Preparedness has been developing local metropolitan medical response systems, MMRS. Through contractual relationships with local communities, MMRS uses existing emergency response systems, emergency management, medical and mental health providers, public health departments, law enforcement, and public health departments to provide an integrated, unified response to a mass casualty event. As of September 30th, 2001, the OEP, Office of Emergency Preparedness, has contracted with 97 municipalities to develop MMRS systems. The fiscal year 2002 budget includes funding for an additional 25 MMRS systems. MMRS contracts require the development of local capacity, capabilities for mass immunization, prophylaxis in the first 24 hours following an identified disease outbreak, and the capability to distribute material deployed to the local site from the national pharmaceutical stockpile. Local medical staff are trained to recognize disease symptoms so that they can initiate treatment and the local capability to manage the remains of the deceased are also included in this effort. We have important lesson learns, lessons learned from the recent September 11th activities. First of all, I'd like to talk about the response and just highlight a few of things that I think are quite exciting. Second, we were able to respond to two sites with medical emergency teams in a matter of hours and provide assistance on site, in some cases minutes to, to hours, and uh, involved on the ground assistance in both uh, Virginia, uh, near the Pentagon, and in New York City. Our stockpile became operational for the first time in terms of deployment, and with a timeline of 12 hours or less, we actually got it there in seven hours. It was one of the few things able to fly and move during that time of crisis with complex coordination with the Federal Aviation Administration and the National Security Community of the United States. We had teams in place shortly. Surveillance was enhanced, particularly in New York City. Our disease detectives from the Centers for Disease Control were on site amplifying surveillance, working with state and local community building on the infrastructure, largely since West Nile, to enhance local public health capacity. A number of important activities have been undertaken by the Secretary of Health and Human Services since uh, September 11th, and they include meeting with pharmaceutical agents, accelerating vaccine production, and taking aggressive steps to accelerate the development, long-term development, of our national pharmaceutical stockpile. On the long-term overview, as an indication of the nation's preparedness for bioterrorism, I'd like to review a little bit about the lessons learned from the top off 2000 exercise in May of 2000. This national drill provided scenarios related to weapons of mass destruction to a, a mass destruction attack against our population. It involved cooperation at the state and local level, FEMA, Department of Justice, HHS, Department of Defense, and many other vital community sectors that would play a role in an actual response. While much progress has been made to date, the number of important lessons that have been from that event have begun to shape our overall views of preparedness. And they are as follows. It's clear from the health perspective, and there are many ways to look at this, but from the health perspective, improving the public health infrastructure, both at the state and local level, remain a critical focus of our terrorism preparedness and response efforts. Such preparedness is indispensable for reducing the nation's vulnerability to terrorism from infectious agents and from other potential emergencies through the development of these broad public health capacities. 
again, state and local capacities. Second, it would also be extremely important to link emergency management services and health decision making at the most local level for the purpose of rapidly addressing the needs of a larger population, particularly a population affected by bioterrorism or other chemical terrorism events. I'd like to conclude and say a few things on behalf of our department, that the Department of Health and Human Services is committed to ensuring the health and medical care of our citizens. And we have made substantial progress to, to date in enhancing the nation's capability to respond to a bioterrorism event. But there's more we can do to strengthen our readiness. I was glad to see through a show of hands that we, people were neither convinced we were ready nor not ready. And I think that is an important indication that the issue of preparedness is a long-term endeavor and will require us to broaden the depth and the breadth of our preparedness activities along all fronts in this war, in this war against terrorism. Priorities include strengthening our local and state public health surveillance capacity, continuing to enhance our national pharmaceutical stockpile, and helping our local hospitals and medical professionals better prepare to respond to a biological or chemical attack. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared remarks, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you or members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you much. Thank you very much. And our uh, second presenter is uh, Bruce Bowman, Director, Planning and Readiness Division of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, otherwise known as FEMA. Good morning, Go Mr. Ahead. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I'm Bruce Bowman. I'm Director of Planning and Readiness for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It's my pleasure to represent Director Albaugh at these important hearings on biological and chemical terrorism. The mission of FEMA is to reduce the loss of life and property and assist in protecting the nation's critical infrastructure from all types of hazards. When di disaster strikes, we provide a coordination and management framework to responding federal agencies and a source of funding for state and local governments. The federal response plan is the heart of that management framework. It reflects the labor of an interagency group that meets in Washington and in all 10 of our, our FEMA regions to develop an interagency capability to respond as a team. This team is staffed by 26 departments and agencies and the American Red Cross and is organized into interagency functions based upon the authorities and expertise of the member organizations and the needs of our counterparts at state and local government. Our plan is designed to augment, not supplant, the response systems of state and local government. Since 1992, the response plan has been proven framework for managing major disasters and emergencies regardless of cause. It works. It worked in Oklahoma City. It worked at Tra World Trade Center. We basically coordinating the responding teams of 14 agencies responding to that event. However, biological and chemical attacks present a unique challenge. Of the two, I am more concerned about biological terrorism. A chemical attack is very similar to a large-scale hazmat incident. Through the National Response Center, the National Contingency Plan, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Coast Guard manage systems that connect local, state, and federal responders and the chemical industry. These systems are used routinely in hazmat incidents. EPA and the Coast Guard are also the primary agencies for hazardous material function under our plan. The model we will use, it is our intent to use this model in the event of a chemical attack. However, to make this model robust and functional, we need to provide additional training for first responders at the state and local level and equipment. In an undetected bio, biological attack, first responders would be doctors, hospital staff, animal control workers, instead of police, fire, and emergency medical personnel. Connections between non-traditional first responders and the larger federal response is not routine. The Department of Health and Human Services is the critical link between the health and medical community and the larger federal response. FEMA works closely with the Public Health Service as the primary agency for health and medical under the federal response plan. We rely on them to bring the right expertise to the table when we meet to discuss potential biological events and how they will spread and the sources and techniques that will be needed to control them. We are making progress. As Scott mentioned, exercise top off in May of 2000 involved a chemical attack on the East Coast followed by a biological attack in the Midwest. We have incorporated these lessons learned uh, in the exercise into our response procedures. 
This process is, a, is active and ongoing. It takes time and resources to identify, develop, and incorporate changes into the system. In January of 2001, the FBI and FEMA jointly published the U.S. government's Interagency Domestic Terrorism Concept of Operation, or CONPLAN. The Departments of Health and Human Services, Defense, Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency were part of that plan. Together, the CON plan and the Federal Response Plan provide the framework for managing the response to the causes and consequences of terrorism. On May 8th, the President asked that the Vice President oversee the development of a coordinated national effort regarding domestic preparedness. The President also asked that the Director of FEMA create an Office of National Preparedness to coordinate federal programs dealing with preparedness for and response to uh, terrorist use of weapons of mass destruction. In July, the director formally established the office at the FEMA headquarters and had staff elements in each of the FEMA, 10 FEMA regions. On, October, on September 21st, in the wake of the horrific uh, terrorist attack at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the president announced the establishment of the Office of Homeland Security in the, office of the, in the, uh, in the White House to be headed by Governor Ridge of Pennsylvania. The office will lead oversee and coordinate the national strategy to safeguard the country against terrorism and respond to the attacks that may occur. It is our understanding that the office will coordinate a broad range of policies and activities related to the prevention, deterrence, and preparedness and response. The office includes the home, a Homeland uh, Security Council comprised of key federal departments and agencies, including the rec director of FEMA. We expect to provide significant support to this office in our new role as the lead federal agency uh, for consequence management. Mr. Chairman, you convene this hearing to ask about our preparedness to work with state and local government uh, agencies in the event of a biological and chemical attack. Terrorism prevents tremendous challenges. We rely heavily on the Department of Health and Human Services to coordinate the efforts of the health and medical community to address biological hazards. We also rely on the Environmental Protection Agency and the Coast Guard to coordinate the efforts of the hazardous material community to address chemical hazards. They need your support to increase the national inventory of response resources and capability. FEMA needs your support to ensure that the system that the nation uses 65 times a year to respond to major disasters has the tools and the capacity to adapt to a biological and chemical attack on any other weapon of ch or any other weapon of choice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would be happy to answer any questions at this time. Well, I thank you. Uh, we have a little problem here, as usual. Uh, we're sent here to vote, remember? And uh, we're now down to the 10-minute uh, bet, and that's the 10-minute uh, warning. And so we're going to go into recess until uh, 12.35, 12.40 in that bird. Uh, right below us in the basement is the uh, splendid, fine, wonderful restaurant known as the Rayburn Cafeteria. So we'll be glad to see you back here, and uh, we'll get to work at uh, 12.35. <laughs> the agriculture bill now passed in the House of Representatives. And uh, we are out of recess, and uh, at 12.35, uh, we will start now with Craig During, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs of the Department of Defense. Mr. During, glad to have you here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the invitation to testify before you today on the Department of Defense's continuing efforts to ensure a strong national defense against domestic terrorists using weapons of mass destruction, or simply WMD. America's National Guard and Reserves are critical to our nation's capability to support an enhanced and integrated federal, state, and local response to incidents involving weapons of mass destruction. We're going to use the term consequence management quite often. At DOD, we define WMD consequence management as emergency assistance to protect public health and safety, restore essential government services, and provide emergency relief to those affected by the consequences of an incident involving WMD agents 
whether they are released deliberately, naturally, or accidentally. DOD normally provides such assistance only in response to requests from the appropriate lead federal agency to support specific state and local authorities in mitigating the consequences of a domestic nuclear, chemical, biological, radiological, or, or high-yield explosive incident. My testimony today will provide a brief description of DOD's role in federal response preparations, as well as an overview of the initiatives we have undertaken to better prepare us to provide the support requested. Presidential decision directives established three years ago directed the U.S. government to enhance its plans and policies to protect against unconventional threats to the homeland and Americans overseas. Since then, there has been a concerted effort to identify and streamline federal agency coordination mechanisms to address the growing possibility of asymmetrical assaults on U.S. vulnerabilities at home and abroad. These efforts focused primarily on establishing policies and programs to enhance the nation's preparations to thwart and, if that fails, respond to terrorist use of weapons of mass destruction or cyber warfare. Federal agency consequence management responsibilities and the need for extensive interagency coordination in response to a significant terrorist incident here at home have been delineated in the documents that were presented three years ago, but which today still serve as the basis for all current federal disaster response plans. Today, federal response to a WMD incident in the U.S. will likely involve many agencies of the U.S. government, each bringing specialized talents and expertise honed in the execution of larger programs designed for purposes other than terrorist attacks. No one agency possesses all the talents but a few, such as the FBI, FEMA, and HHS, know they have lead responsibilities to coordinate our federal response to national emergencies. The federal response plan articulates that distribution of responsibilities and authorities for cooperation and coordination for disaster response. In the event of an incident, we recognize that those closest to the problem are going to be the first to respond. But the presumption is that in the event of a catastrophic incident, those state and local capabilities may be quickly overwhelmed. If a civilian authority requests federal support, the lead federal agency, FBI or FEMA, for example, is likely to request support from many other federal agencies, including the Department of Defense. We have undertaken a number of steps within the, the department to address how we will support the nation in responding to incidents involving weapons of mass destruction. First, we have sought to define more clearly what the department's role should and should not be. We do not call consequence management homeland defense, but refer to it rather as civil support. This reflects the fundamental principle that DOD is not in the lead, but is there to support the lead federal agency in the event of a domestic disaster contingency. Four principles guide DOD's response in the event of a domestic WMD contingency. First, there will be an unequivocal chain of accountability and authority for all military support to civil authorities. Second, DOD's role is to provide support to the lead federal agency. Third, though our capabilities are primarily warfighting capabilities, the expertise that we have gained as a result of the threats we have faced overseas can be leveraged in the domestic arena as well. DOD also brings communications, logistics, transportation, and medical assets, among others, that can be used for civil support. And fourth, our response will necessarily be grounded in the National Guard and reserves as our forward deployed forces for domestic operations. The National Guard and reserves will play a prominent support role for state and local authorities in consequent management. DOD has assigned full-time National Guard WMD civil support teams in 27 states to provide as part of a state emergency response capability the first wave of support to overwhelmed local incident commanders in dealing with incidents involving weapons of mass destruction.
We will soon announce the stationing of five new teams authorized by Congress last year in five additional states, bringing the total to 32 civil support teams. These teams are comprised of 22 highly skilled, full-time, well-trained and equipped Army and Air National Guard personnel. These teams provide specialized expertise and technical assistance to the local incident commander in, first, facilitating on-scene communications and command and control among the different responding agencies. Second, exchanging technical data and information with military laboratory experts on weaponized chemical and biological agents. And finally, helping to shape or revise the local incident commander's response strategy based on the specific chemical, biological, or radiological agents found at the scene. The WMD civil support teams are unique because of their federal state relationship. They are federally resourced, federally trained, and expected to operate under federal doctrine, but they will perform their mission primarily under the command and control of the governors of the states in which they are located. Operationally, they fall under the command and control of the adjutants general of those states. As a result, they will be available to respond to an incident as part of a state response well before federal response assets would be called upon to provide assistance. During FY 2002, DOD will also continue to train and sustain 100 chemical decontamination and nine reconnaissance pl platoon-sized elements in the Army Reserve. Medical uh, patient decontamination teams in the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve will receive additional training in domestic response casualty decontamination. They will be provided with both military and commercial off-the-shelf equipment and will receive enhanced training in civilian hazmat, hazmat procedures. I have more information which I will, uh, will keep uh, dealing with the domestic preparedness program and also with the WMD advisory panel. I know we put it in the uh, hearing without objection so it can be uh, distributed. Yes, sir, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, I have one right now. Uh, yes, I noticed in the paper this morning that uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Wolfitz uh, is the, uh, mentioned the posse comitatus <coughs> situation. And I wonder, uh, was the reserve involved? <coughs> Excuse me, was the re <coughs> Actually, uh, if I'm not aware of what the uh, particular situation is, I am aware of posse comitatus. And when the, uh, the National Guard operates in, in a, a state <coughs> setting, you know, called out by the governor, of course, then uh, their, their uh, rules are different than if they were federalized. So I, I, I have to give you kind of a general answer. I can't be specific because I don't really know what it was they were referring to. Uh, I can understand that, but uh, I think it said he had a 71-page uh, memo on the subject. I happen to agree with him and did that. I agreed that 30 years ago, so it isn't new to me. But I would like to have anything you have to put at this point in the record. Yes, sir. I'll Thank you. Uh, we now uh, go to uh, Mr. Fogg, who is the... Uh, New Hampshire Office of Emergency Management and co-chair of the Terrorism Committee, National Emergency Management Association. Mr. Fogg. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear. Um, I am here today representing the National Emergency Management Association, NEMA, uh, whose members are the directors of emergency management for the states and territories. We're the ones responsible to our governors for disaster mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. This includes responsibility for terrorism, consequence management, and preparedness in each of, the, each of our states. Uh, we, serve, we each serve as the central coordination point for our state's response activities and interface with federal act, with agencies. 
I serve as the current co-chair of NEMA's Terrorism Committee, along with Peter Laporte, the director from the D District of Columbia Emergency Management Agency. And NEMA's Terrorism Committee has been actively engaged for a number of years on this topic. I also serve as chairman of the Northeast States Emergency Consortium, NESEC, comprised of the emergency management directors for the six New England states, plus New York and New Jersey. And I'd like to begin by thanking you all uh, for recognizing the importance of preparing for acts of terrorism. We need and appreciate your support for what we must accomplish. We take an all-hazards approach to disaster preparedness, and I want to emphasize that, all-hazards approach. And therefore, we're able to integrate into our domestic preparedness efforts those proven systems we already use for dealing with natural and technological disasters. We also recognize clearly the value of prevention and mitigation in minimizing the consequences of disaster. And we incorporate those considerations in all our planning. <coughs> NEMA has developed a list of recommended enhancements to be incorporated into a, nation a nationwide strategy for attaining better preparedness for catastrophic events. The full text of these recommendations is included in the attached NEMA white paper for your reference. I'd like to highlight the highest priority items in my testimony today. And before I do that, I'd I'd just like to make the point that the lessons learned from the 11 September attacks are not brand new ideas. Many are concepts we've been working on for years and just have not yet had the resources to fully implement. Now is the time for federal, state, and local governments to take action. It is not the time to prepare reports or criticize past actions or issue sweeping new directives. You have our detailed written testimony, which is fairly comprehensive, uh, but the committee asked us to focus on how the federal government can best work with state and local governments to deal with chemical and biological terrorist attacks, so I'll limit my comments to that issue. The four main points. Number one, our nation requires an overall national, not federal, national, domestic preparedness strategy that's developed collaboratively with full involvement by local, state, federal, and private partners and it's built upon existing all-hazards plans and systems. This national preparedness strategy must be a pillar of our national homeland security strategy. That is, the preparedness component and the law enforcement component together comprise the overall security strategy. We should base that strategy on the tried and proven all-hazards systems, particularly the federal response plan, the incident command system, and our emergency management assistance compact, EMAC, that 41 of our states and two territories have adapt, ad adopted with others in process. We need the federal government to be a catalyst, an enabler, not a controller. And we also need to use the system. Don't bypass the states and their role in coordinating statewide and regional plans. Oftentimes we hear about going directly to the municipalities. And that's great, uh, gets money where it needs to go, but it leaves the states out of their coordinating role. <coughs> And we need to be very careful with that. <clears throat> Two, our nation's preparedness for catastrophic events would be well served by strengthening our regional capabilities. Strong consideration should be given to developing that strategy um, by strengthening our regional capabilities to provide a rapid, flexible response capable of dealing with multiple mass casualty events occurring in different places at the same time. If we put all our resources in one place, we could get in trouble real quick. <clears throat> our federal agencies can help by delegating decision-making authority to their regional offices. Now, some do that quite well now. Director Albar at FEMA is pushing that concept, and that's worked well in the past. Ask at that point, is that uh, the federal government regional areas? There's about 10 they've blocked out over the last 30 years, okay. and uh, you want to operate within that area? That's correct, sir. Okay. That's correct. Delegate the authority to make decisions and make plans to that level. And what that does uh, is develop those relationships, that trust and credibility that's so important in crisis situations, an understanding of each other's resources, uh, constraints, methods of operand, uh, modus, modus operandi, if you will, um, and it eliminates the who's in charge and the turf. And we found that out. That was one of the major lessons learned from our top-off exercise, and we hosted one of the venues in New Hampshire. Those agents, agencies who had developed those relationships and used them succeeded. The others did not. 
Uh, we would encourage broader use of existing regional relationships, and I will just cite NESEC as an example at Northeast States Emergency Consortium. Uh, the details are in the written testimony, uh, but it's been done at very little incremental cost. We expanded on existing um, structure, and it's a good use of federal support. Uh, the other thing we should do is in, in develop our international relationships. I think we've overlooked that in the emergency management field. Three, medical surge capacity is the main key to dealing with mass casualty events, regardless of cause. The most noticeable hole in our system is our limited ability to access and deliver surge capacity rapidly to the site of a mass casualty event. We have some impressive national capabilities, but we need more local and regional capacity close to home to deal with true mass casualties until the cavalry can get there. We need more of those defense uh, disaster medical assistance teams widely dispersed. There are some parts of our country that now are not covered very well by, the, by that system. We need to fill those gaps. And we need faster access to military reserve medical units with their own deployable equipment. And I'd really want to wave the flag on that one. Um, we need to assist the healthcare industry in restoring a surge capacity to our hospitals. The pressures of managed care have virtually eliminated that surge capacity, and we need to work together to restore some of it. Four, the other real key to preparedness is timely sharing and dissemination of critical intelligence information to those who really need to know. Commissioner Norris said it very well this morning, um, but don't leave the state police and the county sheriffs out all levels have got to be involved in sharing of pertinent in intelligence. Again, for the same reason. The state folks need to be able to sort that out on a statewide level and work with their local counterparts and federal counterparts to, uh, to direct resources where they need to go. And the other main issue about the intelligence uh, issue is that it's about, it, it's, it lets the healthcare system and the other first responders have a heightened awareness um, about the potential symptoms. It gives them a heads up, gives them a little warning, uh, and it lets them avoid being second victims and to contain its, the spread and effect of the agent. Um, and lastly, on sharing of intelligence, use the compartmented need-to-know system that the military uses. It works quite well, but we need to have greater reciprocity of security clearances between federal agencies. Right now, if you've got a FEMA clearance, you can't see DOD stuff. If you've got a DOD one, you can't see Health and Human Services stuff. We need to clean that up so we can share intelligence effectively. Let me summarize. Number one, we need a, a clear national domestic preparedness strategy built collaboratively at all levels, local, state, federal, and private. Two, we need to consider strongly strengthening our regional capacities. Three. We need to increase our mass casualty surge capability, especially regionally and locally. And four, we need to improve intelligence sharing across the board. I want to end That's by emphasizing. Suggestion. And uh, I think we're going to have to go to your two other colleagues. To okay, there. I just have one okay. more sentence here. Uh, I want to end by emphasizing that we should build upon the proven, proven systems that we have in place and not reinvent the wheel. Add a spoke or two maybe even combine some, and definitely make the wheel turn faster. But please, let's not come up with a new wheel. And remember, this is not just about terrorism. It is about all hazards preparedness. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was very lucid. Uh, Dr. Smith, uh, Mark Smith, uh, is from the Washington Hospital Center very distinguished uh, institution in Washington, representing the American Hospital Association. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Mark Smith, Chair of Emergency Medicine at Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. And I'm here today on behalf of the American Hospital Association's nearly 5,000 hospitals, health systems, networks, and other health care provider members. We appreciate the opportunity to present our views on hospital readiness for a potential terrorist attack utilizing chemical, biological, or radiologic weapons, as well as explosives, incendiaries, and other more traditional means of destruction. The special responsibilities of hospitals in a terrorist attack is to treat, manage, and mitigate the acute medical consequences that occur. And as this great nation enters into a, a war on terrorism, the American people and government officials need to have confidence in our hospitals and our systems of health care. I have no doubt that American hospitals 
will rise to the occasion, just as they did on September 11th. Hospitals in New York and New Jersey, Virginia and Washington, D.C. relied on their training, their experience, and their prior disaster planning. They performed outstandingly. The hospital system worked. Here at Washington Hospital Center, the regional burn center for suburban Maryland, the District of Columbia, and Virginia, we treated 15 survivors from the Pentagon. Many of the victims were severely burned. On September 11th, we were all part of a seamless single system of rescue, fire, police, EMS, hospital. And it was not only those hospitals that directly cared for the victims. Our region's vast network of hospitals responded. At Washington Hospital Center that morning, we received offers of aid and assistance from Malcolm Grow Medical Center, University of Maryland Medical Center, Johns Hopkins, and MedStar Health's Baltimore hospitals. Offers of personnel, ventilators, medical supplies, hospital beds, whatever was needed. America's hospitals were ready for the foreseeable, but now we must plan for what once seemed extraordinary. To date, the AHA has created a disaster readiness site on its web page, engaged in frequent communication about biologic and chemical preparedness with hospitals across America, and sent out two advisories on hospital readiness. Preparedness work that had occurred quietly behind the scenes during the past several years is coming out into public view, such as the District of Columbia Hospital Association's Mutual Aid Plan, led by Dr. Joe Barbera, or the ER1 Readiness Project at Washington Hospital Center to develop the design specifications for an all-risks emergency department, one that has maximal capability built into it to manage the medical consequences of this terrorism disasters and epidemics. To meet the new challenges that we now face, our recommendations include the following. First, integration of hospitals with police, fire, EMS, and public health needs to occur to a much greater level than exists today. Although not traditionally thought of as such, hospitals are in fact one of the core elements of a community's public safety infrastructure. The hospital is the final destination of every public service agency when injury, illness, or acute exposure occur. Two, hospitals need to increase inventories of drugs and antibiotics to combat the effects of chemical and biologic weapons, such as anthrax, nerve gas. Hospitals need to increase reserves of ventilators, monitors, stretchers, all the basic equipment and supplies needed to treat victims of a mass disaster event. Hospitals need much more robust systems for communicating in real time with other hospitals and with public service agencies in order to better coordinate care for victims. Information provides light, and we are often in the dark. Hospitals need improved systems of surveillance, detection, and reporting in order to identify potential biologic outbreaks as early as possible. Hospital need, hospitals need backup water supplies, auxiliary power sources, and adequate fuel storage. We need our hospitals to be secure and safe under all conditions. Hospitals need to be able to utilize nurses and healthcare personnel who are not licensed locally, but who are licensed in other parts of the country. Hospitals need enhanced ability that currently exists to decontaminate contaminated patients and then to expeditiously care for them. In order to implement these recommendations, we need people, healthcare workers. And right now, American hospitals are facing a severe workforce shortage. Hospitals nationwide have 126,000 vacancies for registered nurses. This shortage cuts right to the heart of communities across America and to our ability to be ready for any need. Legislation has been introduced to address the workforce shortage, and we urge its passage. Our nation's nurses, doctors, and healthcare workers answered the call on September 11th and stand ready to do so again whenever and wherever it comes. But if I could leave you with a final, my one, the summation thought, which is that America's hospitals need to be considered and treated for what they in fact really are, an integral part of our public safety infrastructure. Thank you. Can you give us that nurse estimate? Uh, is it 128,000? 126,000. 126,000. Thank you very much. And now we go to uh, maybe Ms. Maloney would like to introduce him. Uh, Kyle uh, Olson, Vice President, Senior Associate, Community Research Associates. His, his resume is quite long, quite distinguished. He's been at the head of uh, this issue for, for many decades. Uh, many of you may have already met him, as I did originally, from his uh, 
many statements on uh, television, 60 Minutes, uh, Dateline, Frontline. He's been on the front line on this issue, and I'm uh, pleased that he's uh, been a constituent of mine, and uh, I am very delighted that he was able to join us, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for for allowing uh, him to be part of the, the, the panel. Um, I always find his uh, insights incredibly important on this important issue. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Olson, uh, you're vice president and senior associate to the community research associates. Is that sort of a consulting f firm to hospitals? Or? Well, by way of disclosure, I will acknowledge that I have been in now and hopefully after my remarks today will continue to be a scum-sucking government contractor. Um, my firm has worked with the Department of Justice, Department of Defense, uh, state and local governments for a number of years, uh, particularly in the area of WMD training, preparedness, and, uh, and other support. Uh, I will also acknowledge that my uh, remarks today have not been reviewed, probably a mistake on my part, by any of those entities. In the, uh, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today on, and offer my thoughts on the biological and chemical terrorism problem to this committee. In the aftermath of the tragic events of 9-11, the specter of terrorist use of weapons of mass destruction has gone from being a remote possibility that's probably worth planning for to one more aspect of what has become a national nightmare. Many have looked at the threat posed by chemical and in particular biological weapons for the very first time in the last few weeks, while others, including many of today's witnesses, have been working on this problem for a long time. Today, you, me, all of us, are being asked by the American public for an answer that will put, frankly, this grim genie back into the bottle and let us get back to our lives. Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet that's going to slay this monster, nor ensure that it's going to stay in the grave once, it, uh, once it's put there. Even as we focus on Osama bin Laden and his organization, we have to confront the truth. He is not the first, nor will he be the last man to covet weapons of mass destruction. After we run him to ground, we will still have to deal with the potential that these weapons created in the middle of the last century will wreak havoc on the new. To that end, it's important that the answers be simple, that they be complete. It has been suggested that the efforts made to ready cities of this nation to respond to WMD terrorism have been lacking. They've been characterized as a mile wide and an inch deep. This much is true. We could have done more. We can always do more. Maybe exercises could have been more demanding. Maybe the training could have been more complete. Yet it is also true that the Nun Luger de Menici training and exercise program introduced thousands of first responders to a threat that they had never even thought about. New problems demanded new responses and new ideas from police, fire, and emergency managers, and they worked those problems in the context of that program. As a result, there's no doubt we are far better prepared today than we were five years ago, particularly for potential chemical use. On the other hand, the argument has been made all too convincingly that our health establishment is still ill-equipped to deal with bioterrorism. I don't argue that point. Over the course of the last four or five years, the element of emergency services that has been most consistently a no-show at these integrated training and exercises has been the medical community. For whatever reason, time constraints, budgetary limitations, skepticism, in many cities the doctors have not been in the tent. Now, now we are seeing evidence that this is changing. Yesterday's news out of Florida suggests that, that this foxhole conversion comes none too soon. Serious work remains to be done. For example, while it is true that we have federal stockpiles of drugs, we do not have plans that have been tested for distribution of those drugs in the event of a major biological event. We have plans on paper that have not been field tested by and large. But before we join those who fully discount our preparations, consider this. When the World Trade Center fell, New York City activated an emergency response system that had for years deliberately tested itself against the darkest WMD scenarios, chemical, biological, even radiological. New York's leaders understood perhaps better than the rest of us that the world's first city was terrorism's potential primary target. And so they prepared themselves. They took advantage of federal training, exercises, equipment funding, and other help. 
They pushed, they grabbed, they shook the money tree, they played federal agencies against each other, they enjoyed using those duplicative programs that everybody complains about. And at the end of the day, after a lot of work and a lot of soul searching, the city's emergency management system was structured to deal with an event that could leave 5,000 or more New Yorkers dead. New York's planners invented ways to work around the loss of power, communications, transportation. They even confronted the possibility of losing scores of men and women from the city's now legendary fire and police departments. Because they did all these things and thought their way through all these horrible ideas, New York City was better prepared than any city on earth when those towers fell. Observers have noted that the city didn't quit. It wept. We all wept. But New York got up and fought. And I believe beyond the spirit of the city's people that the training helped. No, 911 was not, was not sarin, it wasn't smallpox, but it was mass destruction. The responders in New York had been encouraged to think about the unthinkable. And when it became real, those same responders took actions that saved more than 20,000 lives. A similar story played out here in Arlington, Virginia, where the capital area responders, after years of preparation, managed an efficient, professional response in the attack on the Pentagon. As we discuss where the nation must go in the days ahead, as Congress and the administration consider how to invest our hopes and our treasure, I hope we can appreciate that the efforts of the past five years have not been wasted. They haven't been perfect, what government program ever has been. But they have not been wasted. Much of the criticism directed against the current hodgepodge of federal agencies arrayed against terrorism is, I, I would argue, a little bit out of date. There truly has been a shakeout over the last couple of years with a broader understanding of how the way things are supposed to work. It's a little bit wider appreciated now. It's not a streamlined system, but its functions have become more sophisticated and better targeted over the last several years. We still have overlaps. There are still food fights at budget time. But responder agencies at the state and local level have, in many cases, a pretty good idea of where to go to get help. A major restructuring in the middle of everything else that's going on right now holds out the potential for confusion rather than clarity. I don't know that the best course for this government is to pursue a single homeland defense counterterrorism agency thing that tries to do everything well and ends up doing many things poorly. I actually tend to believe that competition among competing ideas is a pretty good idea. I've seen the wiring diagrams. I know there's urgency to rearrange the deck chairs. But I also know that the small successes of the first few days of the last few weeks in this bizarre, necessary twilight war we are embarking upon stemmed from earnest if frequently clumsy efforts to make a difference. As you consider the path forward, as we all wrestle with the unimaginable, let's remember the instructions given to physicians when they enter into practice. First, do no harm. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start the questioning. I'm going to take three minutes, and uh, I'd like to know from Mr. Lillybridge and uh, Mr. During, uh, Mr. Fogg and Mr. Mm -hmm. Olson in particular, uh, in educating people through professional uh, conferences that go on all over America, uh, are we giving training uh, uh, matters from the federal uh, side and having people at these conferences so they can bring people up to the level that they ought to be if they're going to really be useful? I just wondered how we're using the grant money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would also ask, after a few minutes, that I be dismissed. I have some other I know you've got pressing another, engagements. Yeah. But I'd like to answer that question as best we can. We could always do more, but let me tell you what's in progress and what's been done in, on, along that avenue. First, we've worked with both the Department of Defense to do satellite broadcasts to reach as many as 18,000 health providers at a time. These have been highly successful and have dealt with both chemical and biologic weapons response in the health and medical sector. The second thing is that we've also partnered with uh, the major guilds, uh, professional organizations, and there are a huge number of preparedness efforts in terms of training at these annual and regional meetings, and those are ongoing. Recently, we've also looked towards a partnership at HHS with FEMA on linking emergency management and training at the state, local level in terms of integrating our capacities in, that, in those areas. Well, we'll just go down the line, Mr. Bauman. Any thoughts on this as to grants and how we get that uh, 
uh, people across the country, be it hospital administrators, doctors, uh, also in our medical schools and our public health schools. Uh, and I suspect the, uh, I would hope the public health schools in America would certainly have a course on terrorism and all the rest. I think one of the things we do need to do is to work closer with our public health partners at the state and local level. Uh, at the federal level, and, and Woody can talk about the state level, we work at that level, but what's lacking right now is guidance. Guidance to put out to state health providers, local health providers, on what they ought to be doing. An example is uh, right now, what the word that we, we ought to be putting out to the, to the American public on, what should we be doing as far as protective action guides? As a matter of fact, we had a dialogue with HHS the day before yesterday on this. But I think what, what state and local uh, health providers are hungry for is a lot more guidance on what they ought to be doing to make their health care network uh, more robust in, in light of uh, a WMD-type scenario. Mr. Dury. Well, sir, the uh, training that the Department of Defense does is uh, oriented pretty much towards practical, hands-on application for our own people, and that is continuing. That's, that's ongoing. We have, of course, uh, wartime commitments that parallel the threat that you have here in the United States, and I addressed that very briefly in my opening comments. Now, in addition to that, under the 1997 Defense Authorization Bill called the Nunn Luger uh, Dominici Act, we were tasked initially to go out and conduct training with communities, and there have been references today about the training that was, had gone on in New York. That was part of that program. We actually trained uh, leaders uh, of these various cities in 105 communities. But that, the provisions of that uh, bill have now expired. So uh, to my knowledge, the only other agency that's involved now would be the Department of Justice, and they may have a little more to add if they're here. Mr. Fogg? I would, <clears throat> from a state level, I would say that uh, the National Governors Association, FEMA, through the Emergency Management Institute, all of our other federal partners uh, have been providing good training, and we've been delivering it. Um, the problem, and we've been getting a lot of guidance in terms of planning, you know, how to do planning, and of course we have a pretty good idea on how to do that ourselves, but the problem is we need to link and coordinate those various offerings from all the different agencies and coordinate them so we get the best bite at our local responders' limited time. Most of them are volunteers. There's plenty of training out there, but focusing it, coordinating it so they get the best use of their time so we can attract them is an important thing. And lastly, um, I would say the place we really need to concentrate some effort is on exercising. We can have great plans, we can have great training, but if we don't exercise them to, you know, to get people used to working with each other and understanding what's going on, we're missing the boat and we're not spending enough money and enough time exercising. I'm going to recess that question. I see Mr. Lillybridge does have a chance to get away and do certain things, but could you tell me on what is apparently yesterday's news about an anthrax case in Florida? Was there one? Do we know? Is CDC looking at it or what? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, update on that as, uh, and give you an indication of how the public health system works where we are with that case and what we know to date. As you know, uh, yesterday I reported in the press there was a apparent anthrax case in a single individual who was thought to be non-communicable and thought to be sporadic in nature. That means one of those cases that occur from time to time. Um, we have a robust state and local health department and many accolades to the department, the uh, Florida Department of Health, in their early response. Remember, they're into a three-year preparedness effort with their lab and their surveillance activity. And as we hone our surveillance activity, we're going to be more aware of these outlier kinds of cases. What we know is that the uh, case was uh, entered into the hospital on October 2nd, and within 24 hours, the state had done some preliminary investigation, was able to confirm laboratory testing on this, and uh, confine this to a, a single case at the uh, local facility in uh, uh, near Miami. The uh, prognosis of that person is unclear at this time. However, the test was reconfirmed at CDC 
uh, in a partnership with our, according to our plans, with our state and local partners, CDC disease detectives and laboratorians are working with the state health department to see if there's any additional cases or any additional facts that would help determine where this case came from. We are, as of this morning, and I talked with the people on the ground just before coming to this uh, hearing, and asked if there was any indication that there was a widespread outbreak or any other information that might relate to this hearing, because we might be asked. And the answer was no. But I will assure you, disease detectives are on the ground from both uh, the Florida State Health Department and the Centers for Disease Control, and we'll keep you updated as information is developed. We, we, at, at this point, there's no second case. I at this point, what we are advised by the FBI that this does not seem to be a biological agent attack. We are not finding secondary cases. This person was, became ill nearly a week ago, and by that time, we certainly should see additional cases if this was going to be a widespread problem. Um, again, we'll keep you updated and keep the public updated as information is known. When was the last anthrax case in this country? Well, we have information from uh, 1955 to 1978. We have a total of 11 cases that were documented. Now, remember, as you enhance surveillance, we don't find all these cases until you begin looking. But at, at any rate, we have information on 11 cases, and the last one in 19, clearly 1978, and uh, recently uh, uh, this case in Florida. The, most of these are occupational or related to something you're doing with animals, hides, and that sort of thing. But again, those occurred in the absence of a bioterrorism attack. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're quite welcome. Let's pick up here uh, now with uh, uh, Mr. S Dr. Smith on training and education. how we educate and I think, train. I think what, what's important to understand is that uh, training and education, medical training, medical education, it's not a one-time affair. It occurs um, in multiple venues, uh, national meetings, grand rounds. In fact, uh, two days ago at Washington Hospital Center, the Department of Medicine put on a grand rounds on biological uh, agents. It was standing room only. And I expect a similar thing is happening in hospitals across the country. What we need are resources, um, knowledge, material, and I must say the CDC has done a terrific job on its website. Uh, the material that's there is, uh, is outstanding and has been a resource for many of us, uh, as well as the material that the, uh, uh, the military has put out with its little handbooks on bio and chem uh, agents. So I think what we're going to see is that there's going to be an explosion of, uh, of, of courses and talks on, on this uh, subject. Is anybody on public television doing a say one hour on it or something like that? I, I don't know, but I suspect they probably are. You ought to head in their direction. Thank you. Mr. Olson, any else, anything else on this? Mr. Teaching? Chairman, just a, just a couple of thoughts. First of all, uh, there is, a, uh, there is a, a robust or a fairly robust training program that, uh, that did indeed migrate from the Department of Defense to the Department of Justice. And uh, again, by way of disclosure, my firm has a small part of that, but uh, that doesn't mean it's, it's not any good. Um, furthermore, the, uh, the, uh, the program is designed to reach out to carry the training to the people in, their, in the states, in the local jurisdictions, in recognition of the point that's been made abundantly throughout the day, that the first responders are the first line of defense, and that, and that is absolutely true. I would also uh, just want to, want to point out uh, my very, uh, very real appreciation of the fact that the medical community in Washington, D.C., led by George Washington University Medical Center and, and the Washington Medical Center are both, uh, those are actually a couple of institutions that are right out there on the lead. Uh, they've taken the point on this thing. And they actually, they, I think they point very, very, uh, very, uh, a very important direction for the medical community in this country. However, I, I, I do go back to my initial point, which is that I do not believe that that is representative, unfortunately, of, at this point of where, the, uh, where the, na the nation's medical community is. They're just a little bit behind the power curve at this point. Thank you. Now yield to uh, the ranking member, Mrs. Schakowsky, gentlewoman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry that Dr. Lillibridge um, left, and I was pleased with his comments that um, there was still much more to do, because while I think it's important for us not to unnecessarily alarm people and to overreact at the same time, I um, think it is not a good idea. I know that the Secretary of uh, HHS has been assuring the public that our 
country is perfectly prepared, and it sounded as if it, in all instances for any threat to our, our nation's health. And I think we have to take a very clear and thoughtful look at this and approach to it, and I appreciate all of, uh, all of your comments. Two of you, and I can't remember, mentioned Nun Luger and the funding that it provides for um, domestic work to, train, to, to defend against weapons of mass destruction and provide training, not to mention securing the Russian stockpile of nuclear weapons. My understanding is that in this budget, that um, the, in the um, uh, defense authorization bill, that there is a $40 million cut in, in, uh, in Nun Luger even at the same time as we have about an $8 billion increase in national missile defense, that there's actually been a cut. Clearly, this um, bill was crafted before this threat. Um, how important is this program and is, is this funding stream to the work that uh, you're doing? Anyone can, uh, can answer, Mr. Olson. Um, Congresswoman, the, uh, and I, I, don't want to, I don't want to speak too far on this because I, I, I wasn't involved in the, uh, in the agency perspective in these things, but the, uh, the cut in Nun Luger, uh, the, the program was essentially designed to, to reach out to the 120 or so largest cities. Uh, that program is actually pretty well completing that cycle of work. It was a, uh, a cycle of training followed by a series of, of chemical and biological exercises. Uh, with the, with the, the goal of, re of completing the 120 cities, that training program and that exercise program, again, was transitioned from the Department of Defense to the Department of Justice and is being, has been rolled into other training initiatives which are being managed by that agency. Now, those programs are still, frankly, under development to some extent at this point. Nun Luger is continuing, uh, I believe, through the next year or so. All of, the, all of the cities that were promised training will receive that training. Uh, and then, if you will, the, uh, the, uh, the next generation of training and exercises will follow. Exactly what shape that is, I think, is, is still under development, though. But there is a commitment within DOJ to continue training and exercise work. So there's no loss of actual implementation due to the reduced funding? I mean, it just seems to me if we're looking at where we most um, usefully put our resources, that that kind of effort does need to continue. I, I want to be assured then that it is. My, my understanding, and again, as a scum-sucking contractor, my hopes are that, uh, that in fact that level of effort will continue. I would direct you, I would probably direct you to, uh, to uh, get a better sense of the detailed planning from the Department of Justice's Office for Domestic Preparedness, which has the mandate for continuing that training and exercise program. Uh, I wanted to quickly ask about um, our public health uh, infrastructure. And while I applaud the response that there, that there was, um, it seems to me that um, had there been, and we all wish there were actually more injured than, than there were dead, um, whether or not our, our system could, could respond. But what I'm concerned about, New York, I think was, as you said, I believe, Mr. Olson, probably more prepared than, than anyone else. Had it been elsewhere, it seems that there are many public health offices that are without even some of the, the basics. Um, a doctor from the uh, state of California was saying that her local office before this job was like that, unequipped with uh, fax machines and computers and, and not updated. Um, how big a problem is that around the country, that we don't have this kind of infrastructure? And do we have the communication systems nationally that can transmit information about an anthrax case or this or that that, that would be needed to coordinate a response? Anybody respond to that? I just offer one thought, ma'am. Uh, penicillin and streptomycin pretty well killed the public health service. Uh, once, we, once we shifted to an antibiotic-based approach to medicine, we tended to walk away from many of the things we had done back in the era, era of polio, uh, uh, tuberculosis, uh, smallpox. Uh, at that time, we had a, a very robust system because our only options were to identify outbreaks early and then rely upon techniques like quarantine to control them. Once we found that we could, we could defeat these, these, these diseases, uh, we essentially, I won't say we dismantled, but we, we tended to, uh, to ignore. The phrase benign neglect comes to mind. 
And I think it became a less pressing investment in terms of, in terms of public infrastructure. We are now, I think, recognizing that we have to reconstitute that. I'm not suggesting that we're going to go back to having armies of uh, public health nurses. Uh, there are new technologies, new ways of doing things, and I know the medical community is addressing those surveillance technologies. The Internet is a powerful tool. But the public health system is, is, is not what we would like to think it is. Um, and, and Dr. Smith, are, are we going, how do we increase the numbers in, to the extent that we need to in terms of nursing shortages, et cetera? It's part of the legislation that's been introduced is uh, support for nursing schools, uh, scholarships, all the different ways you encourage people to go into a profession uh, that is um, uh, the backbone of our, of our health care system. Uh, and like most things, it's going to require a, mul a multiplicity of, of efforts. Don't worry about it. <laughs> We're adjourning. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Go ahead. We've got all the peace in the quiet now. They're all Thank adjourned. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, we have to look at the reasons um, why uh, there's been such a, uh, there's now a shortage. And, and it, it really is going to become the, one of the, the great health care crises in this country. Uh, the, if you look at the age spectrum of nurses right now, the ones who are working uh, are slanted towards the older age group. And it, we do not have the younger nurses coming in that we are going to need to sustain all of us when we get uh, to an ages where we're going to need them even more. All right. Thank you. Ms. Maloney, gentlewoman from New York. I want to thank all of the uh, panelists, particularly Mr. Bowman, and uh, publicly acknowledge and for my constituency in New York City and express our appreciation for the ongoing leadership, assistance, help that FEMA is giving to New York City. Uh, Director Alba has spent a great deal of time there, and we appreciate uh, really all of your professional expertise, all your assistance, and your help. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the comments of all of your, the panelists, and I particularly want to thank you for the comments uh, about how well New York responded uh, to the crisis that we had. The command central for emergencies was completely destroyed in, in the attack on the World Trade Center. It was in one of the buildings that later collapsed. And within three days, the city totally rebuilt an alternative command center down at uh, Pier 92, which I think uh, speaks well to the resourcefulness and strength and determination of the American people. I I'd like to uh, ask uh, any of the panelists to comment on this question. It's my understanding that if there was an anthrax outbreak in, in one of our cities, and it turned out to be widespread, that the federal government would immediately get involved and would tap the emergency medical warehouses as one of the eight sites uh, at one of the eight sites around the country. How quickly could uh, these supplies be distributed, and how coordinated are the various uh, governments to ensure quick delivery? As well, that we know that uh, different people would possibly be getting sick at different times. And if anyone would like to respond to that question, I, I'd also I can like respond to, know to that there are. There are now 10 caches. There were eight. We've just beefed that up to 10. Are you 10? <clears throat> the, the caches can be to the affected city or cities within a matter of hours. The problem that we found in, in top off and I think still exists is the ability of the local government to do the distribution and the inoculation, the local health care system. That was a problem if you saw the GAO report in top off. Mm -hmm. So that is still what I think is the long pole in the tent right now. Would anyone else like to comment on how we address this problem? And by the way, we are also, in addition to that, uh, we work with HHS. We are surging the national stockpile as far as pharmaceuticals in addition to that. Mm -hmm. I might add on Ms. Maloney's uh, question, uh, is there anyone from the first panel, and if they'd like to comment on any of the testimony here of the second panel, uh, please come forward and just uh, read your name in it so the uh, reporter mm -hmm. of debates will be able to know who said it. If, if you're still around. So go ahead. Anyone yeah. else care to comment? Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, 
distribution is a, is a real issue. Most uh, jurisdictions are only now thinking about how to do it, and we, they have very little experience in doing something similar. And if you look, one of the tenets of response in a disaster is the doctrine of daily routine. You try to do, in a disaster, uh, extensions of what you do in your day-to-day -day job, uh, because that's how you're going to perform the best. And if we're trying to do something that's totally new and totally different, it's going to be much more difficult to, to affect. And, and yeah, earlier, uh, Dr. Smithson uh, responded to my question about buying antibiotics and uh, possibly a gas mask by saying that it was totally unnecessary. And uh, I have to ask, if it gives people a sense of security and buys them peace of mind, what's wrong with having antibiotic, antibiotics in your, in your medicine cabinet that uh, some doctors say could be helpful in case of a, a chemical or biological attack? And I ask anyone to respond. Mrs. Mrs. Maloney, um, Congresswoman, I, I, this is one that actually hits close to home. I mean, I've, I've been working in this area for, for about 15 or 16 years. And uh, I can sit back and look at this thing very rationally and very calmly and say, well, okay, the best strategy is to rely on, on, the, on the public health system, to count on the surveillance system, to be heightened to a higher level, uh, you know, to, to recognize that there are those, those now 10 caches of pharmaceuticals. And yet when I go home at night, my wife is asking me, what can I do to protect my daughters? What can I do? I need to do something. And given that, um, I'm gonna, I, I guess I'll take exception with my, with my good friend, Dr. Smithson, uh, from, her, from the earlier panel. I don't necessarily see anything wrong. If it makes you feel better, go ahead and go out and buy a gas mask. Why not? 50 bucks, 100 bucks. If it makes you feel better that you've got that on the shelf, Odds are you're never going to pull that thing down, but you're never going to hurt yourself with it either. If you go to your doctor and get a prescription for antibiotics, if he knows you and he's giving you a meaningful prescription and gives you some good advice on, on what and when, why not? There are very few things that an individual can do. This, this, is, a, this is a mission for, for, for government and collective response. But I, I tend to fall on the side of those people who are saying, you know, look at the Israelis. You know, they've been, they've been living on the edge for 50 years, and they do these things. You know, we're, we've been on the edge for three weeks, and if it buys us a little, piece of, a little peace of mind in these very uncertain times, I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure I'm going to stand up and tell somebody, don't do it. What, what, I, what I find somewhat troubling from the presentations we've heard today is everyone says, don't worry, be calm, and yet the testimony is saying that we have these caches, but we don't have to distribute it. We don't have in place a way to distribute antibiotics or, or vaccines in a quick way. And uh, we don't really have the surveillance or the intelligence. We don't have the coordination between the FBI and the local response uh, people. And you're telling us basically that we don't have the health care workers that are trained and they're not vaccinated yet and for certain things that some people are saying may happen. Uh, and yet you're telling us not to be concerned. So. The question that I get asked the most when I go home is the question that Mr. Olson's children are asking him and his wife is asking him, what can we do for civil defense? When I go home to my community meetings, uh, people know we're at risk. It's common sense. Who would have ever dreamed that anyone would fly and turn our, our airplanes into a weapon of mass destruction against our own uh, uh, Department of Defense and our own financial center? They're absolutely unbelievable. They even had one man who was saying, just train me to fly a plane. I, didn't know, I don't even know how to, I don't want to know how to land and I don't want to know how to take off. That was reported and no one knew what to do with it because no one could ever imagine that this could happen. So I, I, I think that uh, we have to imagine or think that uh, something horrible may happen. And my question is, what can we do for civil defense back in our own homes? Um, Mr. Olson mentioned Israel. Israel has uh, trained for many years for civil defense, um, having had many uh, terrorist attacks in their own country. Are there programs or models that they have that we could implement here in our own country? And what can we tell our constituents when they say, what can we do back in our own city, our own farm, or wherever they are, uh, to protect ourselves in the, in, in the event of one of these terrible attacks? I think there's a couple of things. First off, one of the things that we're working on right now 
is to set up a joint information center with all the agencies that have expertise in this particular area to talk about what we need to be telling the American public and when we ought to be telling the American public. A lot of it is just information. But how do we get the information down to folks like, like Woody and the, the fire chief to get that information out? Right now, we don't have real good dis dissemination systems. For example, uh, while in the law enforcement arena, you do have a means of passing law enforcement sensitive data, there is no means that we have readily available to pass that down to the firefighter on the street that needs that information. So how do we get that out? That is one of the things that's been pointed out in the pro as problems in past disasters. We right now have got some things in the works to look at some short-term fixes for that, but that is a long-term pole in the tent that uh, I think we need to come up with a solution to. But before you even get to the firefighter or fire officer, in a real disaster, many people will not have the opportunity to talk to anyone except their immediate family. And my question is, what do we say to these people who are saying, what do we do for our own defense that we can do ourselves to protect ourselves because we don't have enough police or fire out there in the event that if something happened quickly. There is a list of protective action guides that many hospitals have, many health care systems have, mm -hmm. that we could quickly put together to deal with a situation like this, or in some cases they have already done that. Mm -hmm. We should be getting that out sure. now to the public. That Don't is correct. Think? We should. Would the uh, gentleman yeah. yield? Oh, okay. I, I um, will after the panelists have a chance to respond, because I want to hear I, 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 I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very real question. And it, the answer has got to be based on facts. Um, uh, and the answer may turn out to be something we're going to do things we never did before. I mean, the truth is, the, a number of the bio agents uh, have, an, have a incubation period. And during that incubation period, where you're asymptomatic, if you were to take a simple antibiotic, you can prevent yourself from getting the disease. Uh, it's a reasonable question to ask if you're in a high-risk area whether you should have a supply of doxycycline, which is the drug, uh, around. Now, there are always problems with taking antibiotics, with side effects, with uh, outdated drugs, and that's why the answer is not simple. But it definitely has to be considered, and quite frankly, uh, many of my uh, healthcare colleagues uh, have, have personal stocks of uh, doxycycline and ciprofloxacin, and that's the truth. And I guess if you abide by the golden rule that you should do unto others, you do unto yourself, then we should be considering this. I, I think that, um, you know, I've, I've been watching the news last week or over the last couple of weeks. I would much rather see people out there buying some antibiotics than buying guns. It's going to make a much bigger impact. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentle lady for, for uh, yielding. Um, I think that individuals do want or uh, planning escape routes in our own home if, in case of, of fire, evacuation plans from buildings and those kinds of things we do. But I think, and I, I would recommend, and I don't know if it's to, to FEMA or to HHS or what, I think people are also looking in collective ways of what to do. And there, there may be a um, non-governmental organizational infrastructure that people could be plugged into in an, in an effective way that we might want to make suggestions to people, ways that we can help our local fire departments or ways that we can um, get involved in. We have it for fighting crime, neighborhood watch groups, um, communication systems. I'm not really sure, but I think some thought is useful because people are lining up to give blood. People want to do something. And I think there may be constructive ways that ordinary people in their communities can play a really constructive role and would welcome those su suggestions and would even implement them themselves at a local level if there were good ideas. Reclaiming my time. I just have one last brief question. And I'd like every panelist to answer it. And it's, what is the number one thing you think we should focus on in preparing for chemical and biological attacks? What's the number one thing we should focus on? Just go down the line and give us your thoughts. Medical community. Medical we, community. Need, we need to train doctors to recognize these things. We need to teach them what to do when they recognize them. And we need to ensure that the, that the systems that exist in the very best hospitals for surveillance and for communication are present across the board. Creation of a much more robust information and communication infrastructure that will permit integration across 
agencies, uh, among hospitals, people. Better sharing of intelligence, that's the best, best way to prevent it and minimize it in the first place. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Complete implementation of the health alert network, it's a great idea. Uh, we've got well down the road, but we need to get the rest of the way. We need buy-in from everybody. That's something the public could be, should be informed about and, and supportive of. And lastly, medical surge capacity at the local and regional level. From a defense angle, if you want just one issue, training. Training is a very perishable commodity because you can train one person today and that person may be gone tomorrow. And it, with such a large program like this, we have to always make sure that we are organized and funded to be able to train our people and continuously train them so that whenever the next crisis occurs, wherever it occurs, that we're there to help them. I'm going to voice my organizational bias. I think we've got to have a strong emergency management system uh, from local government to state government up. Yeah. Our, our system and Woody's system at the state level integrates all the state agencies. Responding to a situation like that is not a single agency. In, in New York City, we responded with 14 federal agencies to that one incident. So you've got to have HHS, you've got to have EPA, Coast Guard, DOD, and the other agencies integrated in that process down at state and local level. You need to have fire, hazmat, and public works integrated into that response. And right now, we are putting very little money into emergency management at the state and local level. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, the uh, Controller General of the United States has a very good crew in the uh, GAO, General Accounting Office, and we're looking just at those to see if those places uh, by state and region, and we'll be doing that over the next two months. To, there's the pieces there, but again, the communications sometimes are lacking. Uh, let me ask my last question, I'm sure, and that's uh, Mr. During is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs, and I note here that uh, Dr. Smithson's testimony in the New York City terrorist attacks, uh, she said that the uh, New York State's National Guard civil support team did not reach the site until 12 hours after the collapse of the Twin Towers. What caused the delay? There were a couple of things that happened. Number one, they were notified and alerted immediately. Within 90 minutes, they had moved to a staging area and were ready to go. Uh, of course, uh, as a lot of people know, with the, the things that happened after 90 minutes, the, the communications were destroyed and the people who were tasked to actually call out the team were killed. And so there was a, a, a bit of confusion and they were summoned. Eventually they responded, they did their work, I believe in a 17 block area, searching for the, the possible contaminants of some type. They determined the area was free and clear. They withdrew and actually were recalled two other times to assist in communications because the teams have some unique equipment in, uh, installed in their vans which uh, allows them to actually marry together various communication systems that the fire department or the EMTs or whoever it happens to be might have and when they can't talk to each other, they can through this unit. So they were very valuable. It was a unique situation driven by the events of the time. Have any of you had a role for the America Corps? A lot of us pushed that uh, 10 years ago and came out of a group of university presidents that we thought this was a good idea. And have any of you used it? And should they be used? Uh, yes, we have. We've used, uh, we've used AmeriCorps. Uh, folks rather extensively in the state of New Hampshire, not specifically for biological chemical preparedness, but all hazards preparedness, uh, by having them work with some engineers, uh, do review of critical facilities in the state uh, and ass assess their vulnerability and measures we can take to, uh, to improve their survivability, not only to, to man-made uh, issues, but to natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, snowstorms, ice storms, that sort of thing as well. Uh, they've been extremely valuable in that process. 
And likewise, we use AmeriCorps, too, on natural disasters. We have an MOU with AmeriCorps, but uh, I, we haven't worked out a role for them in this type of environment. Will, will the gentleman yield for one quick question? Yes. Uh, on, on September 11th, I uh, want to respond to your comments on, on communications. Uh, on September 11th, I drove home and went to what was then Command Center at One Police Plaza. And the number one thing they said they needed was communications. All communications were down. And they really couldn't talk to each other. And one of the things I did was call uh, Chairman Young and his staff, because he was involved with defense. And I know he, he shipped uh, a, a load of um, satellite phones down, which is what they were asking for. So my question to you, learning from, from the World Trade Center disaster, and in your comments earlier that the response time, the early days, are when you save people. Each day that goes by, the opportunity to recover someone diminishes. And one of the things the rescue workers have told me that what really strapped them for days was the inability to communicate, that you literally had to um, walk to a person to communicate to them. There was very little communication. And I, I uh, just ask, maybe not for this panel, but maybe to get back to the chairman, your ideas of what we could do to improve communications. Did the satellite phones work? Uh, were they? Is that what we should have ready uh, at FEMA to deliver quickly? Uh, you know, I just didn't know how to get them, so I called Chairman Young because he's with defense. I thought if anybody's got them, defense has got them. But, uh, you know, in other words, how do you respond to that one problem that you were mentioning and that really I heard at Ground Zero the night of September 11th, one of their biggest challenges was not the inability to communicate. And it, and it went on for days, weeks. That, right. the, that the communication system wasn't working. The, the problem was cell phones were, were useless as they normally are in any major disaster because the usage on the cells go up, they get saturated. The public switch network was affected so that it was sporadic at best. Satellite communications and uh, uh, high frequency radio was the only means of communications at the time. Uh, we do, and if, if a request comes to us, we can tap into any one of the 26 agencies, DOD is one of those. National communications system and their uh, National Communications Center has about 27 agencies that have telecommunications assets that can be brought to bear. Satellite communications or sat phones, getting that to the area shouldn't have been a problem. If the request is put in the right channels, we can get it there. On that point, uh, the Army, as you know, over the last few years have uh, started moving communications and uh, generally computing uh, different things that a soldier does and uh, do that one person on the battlefield. And uh, it seems to me some of the domestic agencies might want to look at the communications side of that because I have heard a lot of complaints about the uh, 999s and either we ought to have more operators or more satellites or something. I remember in my uh, university in Long Beach we had an exercise there, and uh, nobody could talk to each other in all of L.A. County. Now, that's 10 million people there, and no other part of the United States has 10 million within that particular jurisdiction. And uh, <coughs> that we were told, well, all the licenses are on the East Coast. And I don't know how much that's been changed, because nobody's brought it to me if they have, but uh, we, ought to, we need some linkage there. Uh, in terms of getting that. I don't know if FEMA is familiar with that. If not, let's all go to the FCC. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, one of the things we're doing is we are in the process of doing some catastrophic planning. Terrorism is one of the scenarios, and we are putting a lot of time and effort in that in the upcoming year, primarily in five different scenario areas, to take a look at, and the L.A. Basin is one of those, uh, to take a look at each one of our 12 functional areas and what we need to, to do to enhance telecommunications, uh, health and medical in that particular area following a catastrophic event. Yes, uh, Mr. Dr. Chairman, Smith. would you permit me 90 seconds to um, respond to one of the points that my colleague had left about the lack of involvement of the medical community in this planning? Because I think it's an important issue, and I think it's important to realize where there has been, why it's occurred. It, uh, in my view, it is not because of the disinterest of, uh, of, of physicians to participate. In many cases, 
uh, medical community is simply not asked. We have been excluded by the public service ag safety agencies because we're not considered a public safety agency. It's all police, fire, uh, and EMS. The second point is that hospitals have lots of things on their plate. Their primary mission is taking care of an individual patient. That's their job. Um, and that's actually what, they're get, what they get paid for. No insurance payer pays for emergency preparedness. We're, we're sort of at the margins. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 Ms. Schakowsky asked about uh, why, why the nursing problem. Uh, part of the problem is money, because uh, we, don't, we don't have money to pay maybe the salaries that we need to pay to attract people. Um, so that we have to figure out a way to support hospitals, which are really the only private sector in this, uh, in this quadrant of police, fire, and EMS. The other three are all in the public sector. Yes, Dr. Mr. Earls. We're going to step outside and drop the gloves in a second. But uh, uh, whereas that may be, that may in fact be the case in some in some locales, uh, there have certainly been other opportunities where the public health sector, the private health community, was specifically invited, and again opted not to participate. It's there are no simple answers. I'm not suggesting that it is. I'm not even suggesting that there's that there's a lack of desire to do something. I acknowledge every one of the. Uh, of the structural problems that were identified by Dr. Smith just now. I think that, uh, that nonetheless, uh, the bottom line for all of us now is not, and I, I heard it down the, down the way here, it's not to go back and beat each other up over what we didn't do in the past, it's to identify what we need to do together in the future. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Fogg? I would have to say that our experience um, has been extremely positive once, and I guess we did it from the emergency management um, profession, but in New Hampshire we asked, and actually our three states, Maine, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, um, together as a result of the top-off exercise, uh, reached out to the, to the medical community, uh, and I've been very pleased with the response we've received. I mean, we recognize there are, there are gaps there. We recognize the economic concerns, and we're trying to work together in spite of those constraints. Um, to improve the medical surge capability. I've been very impressed at the response and the progress we've made already. But can we do it without an additional help? No. Yeah, I, we I, need help. I would, I would just indicate I think Topoff is an example of, of one, one case where it definitely worked, where the medical community, in, not only in the Northeast, but also in Colorado, in Denver, and others, did come together and did, did play well. But that was, a, that was a very high profile, very long term effort that took a lot of, lot of effort to make that happen. Again, that's in the past. Let's move forward. Whatever happened to Vermont, you didn't seem to mention Vermont. Well, I'm glad you asked, because right now, <laughs> the, best, the best cooperation we're getting, once we started that after Top Off, has been uh, 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 our upper valley in New Hampshire that re actually reaches up into Vermont, a watershed, uh, along the Connecticut River. And the cross-coordination cross between the Vermont medical community and the New Hampshire one, uh, spearheaded primarily by Dartmouth Medical Center in Hanover, uh, right on the border, has been astounding. And we've reached out to public health service on a national level. Uh, I, I feel really good about what we're doing there. We just need time and a little more resources to get where we want to go. Well, thank you. Any other thoughts before we gavel this down? Well, if not, I'm going to thank the staff that put this hearing together and these hearings are about to come all over the country. Uh, J. Russell George, Staff Director and uh, Chief Counsel. Uh, Matt Phillips on my left is the professional staff member that uh, put all the pieces together for this hearing. Mark Johnson, our clerk, and uh, Jim Holmes, our intern and the minority staff. David McMillan, professional staff. Gene Gosa, minority clerk. And two faithful, hardworking court reporters namely Julie Thomas and Mark Stewart. And uh, we thank you all. It's a tough one. So we are now going to uh, recess the committee until we go to New York.